Uh, we're going we're gonna to start up again, please. And um, uh, we, as you can tell from the last panel, uh, the design of this uh, Wires University is to go from 101 to 201. We're, we're getting uh, further into the weeds, and we have some really excellent speakers on our next, uh, our next panel. Uh, two people uh, I know very well, primarily because uh, they have done reports for wires um, uh, that I think uh, 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 stand uh, as some of the best scholarship on the electric transmission system uh, that's been done in, in, in North America. Uh, Hannes Pfeifenberger uh, is a, a, an economist uh, uh, with a background in electrical engineering. He's with the Brattle Group. Uh, up in Cambridge, uh, he is um, he, he's uh, he he lives and breathes uh, transmission, transmission economics, and uh, has done a study for us uh, two years ago on the benefits of transmission, uh, which I think stands the test of times. It's the only place you can find a really succinct, uh, well-rounded um, uh, explanation of the multiple benefits that transmission projects can provide beyond reliability, beyond, beyond production cost savings. Um, uh, uh, he is going to talk this morning about uh, uh, transmission as, as a market enabler, but that's a fairly big, uh, a big concept. Uh, and uh, uh, Hannes is uh, 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 one of the people that we rely on very heavily for for some uh, skilled analysis, uh, he is um, uh, he has a an MA in economics and finance from Brandeis, uh, an MS in power engineering and energy economics from the University of Technology in Vienna, and we're not talking Vienna, Virginia. We're talking <laughs> we're talking Vienna, Austria. So um, our our uh, he will be followed by uh, another excellent. Um, uh, economist, uh, managing director at London Economics, Julia Freyer. And this little gem is what Julia did for us last year. Now, both of these reports are available either outside or in the lobby as you leave, uh, but I, I recommend them highly. And if you're, they're too heavy for you to put in your briefcase, you'll find, also find them on our website. Our website is www.wiresgroup.com, and um, there's a lot of good stuff on there, but this is some of the best. Uh, Julia's uh, piece here is on what FERC erroneously called non-transmission alternatives, what we call market resource alternatives, including storage, distributed generation, utility scale generation, um, demand response, and so forth, and, and how that works with transmission uh, to make a more robust, resilient um, transmission uh, grid. Um, and and uh, uh, Julia has uh, 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 a great deal to say, and somebody we would rely on a great deal for her expertise uh, in electrical, uh, in electric bulk power matters. She has dealt with innumerable um, uh, transmission projects, including the Montana Alberta tie and, and a number of others. So uh, this, is, uh, this is your chance to get uh, some very, very uh, good input, and I hope you have good questions for both of them. So, Hannes? Thank you, Jim. Uh, it's nice to be here again, or as we say in Austria, I'm back. <laughs> or something like that. But um, let's talk about uh, what we're going to do today. And uh, I'm going to briefly talk about how much uh, we've invested in transmission and what we'll need, some of the key barriers to planning more effectively a, what we call a robust transmission grid, the often overlooked benefits of a flexible and robust grid, the high costs and risks of not having enough transmission when you need it, um, and uh, the need for more effective interregional planning, and then end with some recommendations for policymakers. Now, this might be too far for you to see in the back, and I apologize for not bring, getting my slides in on time, but they will be posted, so you'll have them electronically. Uh, this chart starts in 1960, 
and ends in 2015, and you see that most of the grid that we rely on today was built in the 60s and 70s. And it shows that draft in the middle, there were two decades where we basically have not invested much of anything in the transmission grid. So the grid we're using today for wholesale power markets for deregulated transmission of, of the last uh, 10, 20 years is really uh, the transmission that we built in the 60s and 70s. And that's getting old, and that's getting inadequate in terms of uh, not quite having built for the purpose that we need that we need it for today. Now, the good news is, in the last 10 years or so, we have started to invest again in transmission. Uh, so in the, what this shows in the 90s, we invested about $2 billion a year or so in transmission, and that has increased to about... Um, $16 billion as of 2013, and the 2014 numbers aren't quite in yet. Uh, you see some projections uh, that are supposed to stay quite high. Now, this means a lot of different things. One is that because we haven't been investing, we do need to invest to catch up. Just like we have to rebuild bridges, we have to rebuild the grid. But if we have to uh, upgrade aging facilities, let's think about how to spend that money well. Just replacing one facility that was built in the 60s with an equivalent facility today may not make any sense. If you spend that kind of money, let's think about what other options we have to make to get the most out of the money that, that we spend. Uh, there are numerous drivers for the need for new transmission. Um, we have projected, and you can find those studies on our website, that we'll need about 120 to 160 billion a decade over the next 10, 20 years. And uh, there are numerous drivers, not just aging facilities that we just talked about, but we do need to integrate renewables. And the lowest cost resources by far, when it comes to renewables, are fairly far from loads. Now, here in the US, uh, we may not be quite as used to that, but uh, the fact is a lot of the best wind is in the Midwest, in the Great Plains, where there's very little transmission. But when we talk about the grid, um, and I have to say we've, we've seen all those maps today, you might not have noticed, but Canada is actually on that map too. And we're actually quite interconnected with Canada, and the Canadians know that the low-cost resources are often very far from, from the population centers, and uh, they have managed to do that. And I think we need to integrate some renewable resources. Um, it will take transmission but it will save you way more on, on the cost of producing power than what you spend on transmission. We also have coal plant retirements. We have uh, unexpected load growth in places like uh, Western Texas, where there's a lot of oil and gas drilling. So we do have to invest. Now we might just as well now figure out if we have to spend $160 billion over the next decade, how do we spend it best? And so we are coming out with, an, with a new study in two days where we looked at how effective current transmission planning is. And we're not talking about just reliability planning. The industry really knows how to keep the grid reliable. This is not a rickety old grid. It is actually a very reliable grid. But economically, it doesn't quite do uh, what, we, what it could do in terms of keeping the costs low and meeting public policy objectives. And there are really three barriers. One is our planning processes do not adequately consider the wide range of benefits that transmission provides in terms of reducing the cost of delivering power. We are also not accounting in those economic planning processes the high risk of high cost events. The California power crisis could have been avoided had there been more transmission, studies have shown. But we're not even thinking about those economic events. We're thinking about reliability, but the fact is prices spike way before there's a reliability event, and we have many more price spike events than we have reliability events. And then we talked a lot about the regions like PGM. Um, the planning of transmission between these regions is just ineffective right now. We're trying to set that up, but the processes that exist right now, even though they exist, uh, they are not really effective in terms of getting interregional transmission uh, identified, planned, and built. 
And in fact, some of these seams between the regions look like demilitarized zones where uh, nobody has built a new line in quite some time. Of course, there are challenges to cost allocation, siting and permitting and so on. But if we don't get this right, we're either not investing in enough transmission to keep power prices low. We have to think about transmission is about 10% of what we pay for electricity. If we double spending on transmission and we are reducing the rest of the costs by 10%, we're still better off, right? Because there's a huge leverage that transmission provides in making the power system work and be more cost effective. But we are just not identifying the right projects that the money that we have to spend can get us if we don't even understand the economics and the risks of that. So the study that Jim mentioned in 2013 goes through the full range of benefits. And um, of these eight squares or uh, whatever I uh, call we are only in the economic planning processes that most regions are doing today. They're considering half of that middle square. We are looking at production cost savings, but not even doing that very well. We are not considering that even if you don't build a new project for reliability, it will improve reliability. We are not uh, considering that it would reduce the cost of uh, investing in generation. We are not uh, considering that transmission makes markets more competitive. We are not um, typically considering the environmental and public policy benefits of transmission infrastructure um, and many project specific benefits such as storm hardening and many others. In our study, we have the big checklist of uh, benefits that uh, we recommend people consider uh, when evaluating new transmission projects, but uh, that's way too much detail. So why, why is this important? Well, here's an example. The red line is a cost, the annual cost of, of a new power line, a specific power line that has been evaluated by the California ISO in 2004. And the production cost savings that most people calculate these days in the planning process are that blue bar. And you look at this and say, well, this is not cost effective because the production cost savings are less than the annual cost of, of the line. Well, that's where the other benefits come in. You see, once you consider the other benefits that transmission provides, uh, the benefits are far lar larger than the cost of the line. And this is, it says, base case. Well, what does base case mean? That typically means under normal conditions, normal weather, you know, nothing unusual, no big transmission, out no transmission outages, no big generation outages. But we all know that if everything is normal and we don't have a heat wave and, and the summers are nice, we don't need that much transmission. The Cal ISO did a study on some of the more extreme cases um, that you might encounter, and they found, I mean, this line is, the bar on, on the right is 100 million. There's about a 10% chance that in any particular year, these benefits could be between 200 and 700 million dollars. And compare that to the cost of 70 million dollars. So there's a big risk insurance, risk mitigation factor. But we don't really plan for these risks, not the risks in the short term, not in long term. We do it for reliability but we don't do it for economics. And uh, I'm, I think we don't have that much time, so I'm not gonna get into these things, but the risk mitigation is very important. We have this planning paradigm that has evolved called least regrets planning process. So what it usually means is let's only focus on those projects that are beneficial under almost any circumstances. Well, what this forgets about is that there could be many regrettable circumstances that could result in very high cost outcome, but we're not planning for them. Well, think about insurance. We are focused too much on the cost of insurance and not enough on the cost that you might be exposed to if you don't have insurance. If you buy insurance, are you focused more on the cost of the insurance or are you focused more on the costs that you might expose to if you don't have insurance. Well, you have to look at both. 
But transmission planning, for the most part, forgets about the economic aspects of the uh, insurance of not of the cost of um, not having transmission when you need it. And a brief word on interregional planning. That's sort of the, the stepchild of, of the industry. And it just doesn't work. It, uh, you know, we're getting there, we're making progress, but it's going to be a while. One of the reasons why it doesn't work is, for economic planning at least, we have this, we're stuck in this least common denominator process where two neighboring RTOs, they all have their own sets of benefits that they consider. But for lines between the regions, I say, well, we only consider on the benefits that we both agree on. So what happens is that you have the full range of benefits. Each RTO internally considers one of these circles. But when it comes to going to evaluating lines going across the regions, they only look at the overlap of these two circles. So the economic benefits of uh, interregional projects are hopefully understated. And with that kind of approach, no sizable project will ever pass these tests because you're ignoring 90% of the economic benefits. We also have a problem that this is a busy chart, but transmission planning is compartmentalized. People plan separately for reliability projects, for market efficiency projects, for public policy projects, and sometimes for multi-value projects. So if you have two RTOs next to each other, and they insist, well, we have a tariff for interregional reliability projects, and we have a tariff for interregional market efficiency projects, that framework cannot evaluate a project that might be reliability in one RTO, but market efficiency in the other. So if all these 16 squares on there, these interregional planning processes are only good for three of them. So we are a whole host of projects that have different purposes in the neighboring RTOs will be automatically excluded from the interregional planning processes because it doesn't fit into the definition of these projects. So a few recommendations, and that will be elaborated in the report that's coming out two days from now. We really recognize that policymakers are the key here, state and federal policymakers. And so this is a recommendation to policymakers, not so much to the planners, because the planners won't be able to go there unless policymakers recognize ought to consider all transmission-related benefits. Otherwise, we're being penny-wise and pound-foolish. And we have to better understand the high risk of not having a, a flexible, a robust transmission grid, particularly if the future is uncertain. We need to plan for the uncertainty. We can't wait for the uncertainty to, to resolve itself because it takes five to 10 years to build a line. And if we wait, uh, we won't have the low-cost options available because if we have to act within two, two or three years, uh, the lowest-cost options will not be available to us because it takes more time to build good new transmission projects. And we need to get away from compartmentalizing transmission planning. Every transmission line has multiple values, and we need to recognize that. And finally, we ought to do something about interregional planning. And with that, let me turn it over to Julia. How do you get? While well, we're changing over, does anyone have a, a question for Hannes? Mm -hmm. That's a, a boatload of information. I should I should mention that. The Brattle Group, uh, Hannes and his colleagues, are, uh, right. have Thank developed you. another study which is partly reflected in this PowerPoint, and uh, you'll see that maybe as soon as this week. So. so, good morning, almost good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm pleased today to present a few thoughts. Um, I think um, I always say uh, to my kids when they complain about school being um, repetitive that, in fact, that's how we learn. So 
I will in advance note that I think there's repetition between what Johannes has said and what I say, and actually even repetition from some of the discussions this morning as well, and I hope that serves you all well, because I think we're trying to make sure we hit at the key messages from different directions. So let's take it down this direction. And specifically what I wanted to do today was to talk about a white paper that Jim had mentioned earlier in his introductions, a white paper about market resource alternatives. Um, and this fits well, I think, with um, the topic that I'm supposed to speak to, which is transmission as a technology uh, partner. Um, uh, so some high-level findings. And maybe to start off, um, I should define what is a market resource alternative. Um, and um, I think the best way to think about it, um, Adrian did a wonderful job this morning telling us about what transmission is. So think of market resource alternatives as everything else. And in fact, in your um, packets, you had a, a figure that we excerpted from um, our white paper report issued last year that uh, categorizes and lists some of the technologies with, we think of today as market resource alternatives. Jim also hinted um, in his introductions that there was a misnomer used, um, a misnomer that called market resource, oh my gosh, I can't speak this morning, market resource alternatives as non-transmission alternatives. And I hope um, from the discussion today in the presentation, you'll understand why I think of that as a misnomer as well. Um, and uh, frankly, it's because it implies that transmission has a substitute, an alternative. Um, and um, if you really do think about our system, our system isn't about transmission pieces here, generation located there, um, wind generators in another location. The transmission that you and I use when we turn on the light switch and expect electricity to flow through our house or business is really being delivered from an integrated system, um, a machine, I heard somebody say a marvel of the 21st century, and it's uh, the reliable so service at least cost that we expect is really about the various um, components of that system working together, the transmission, the generation, the distribution systems, the smart technology, which I'll speak to a little bit, and also even consumers, which um, there's a new uh, tag word in the industry, prosumers, consumers that are actually also uh, generating electricity by the devices they have installed on their homes and properties, uh, consumers that are also being more intelligent with time in the choices they make about consumption of electricity. So with that in mind, um, you may ask, um, so MRAs, what are they? Well, the MRAs in this chart would be everything um, that we can think of, but uh, um, the transmission wires. Um, so it is the uh, energy storage, the wind and solar generation, the light bulbs represent energy efficiency projects, it is the um, demand response and distributed generation and smart grid technologies represented by that house with with appliances. Um, it is also the conventional generation technologies that um, we drive by and some of us work at um, um, that uh, define the landscape for market resource alternatives. So with that, uh, before we start examining uh, in a little bit more depth MRAs and the key findings of our report, I wanted to speak about why MRAs are now a promin prominent topic of discussion. And in my opinion, it can be traced to the restructuring of the electricity sector to some degree. And I know on this next slide I use the the word that I shouldn't be using given the discussions we just had, deregulation, but it really is the restructuring or deregulation that has occurred in the last two decades that has changed our thinking about investment um, and has also raised the, the discussions we're having today about transmission or MRAs or both. Um, before, in the integrated resource planning days when we had a vertically integrated utility, it was the utility uh, that was deciding on which resources to invest in and build, uh, generation, transmission. It was the utility funding energy efficiency conservation programs, which have frankly been with us for decades upon decades. Um, that is no longer the case for many parts of the U.S., um, even parts that still have local vertically integrated utilities, because planning now involves a lot of different entities. It involves what I would call independent power producers, IPPs, in the green tax box. 
that make decisions about where to put their generation investment. It involves RTOs, ISOs, as you've come to uh, learn today, uh, as well as member utilities who are planning the system, planning where distribution investments should take place, where transmission investments should take place. Um, and it also involves consumers who, through their own um, uh, interests and financial considerations, through utility-funded programs and other types of um, uh, incentives, are looking at um, uh, demand response, energy efficiency, and distributed generation. So um, I think uh, this leads me to the discussion. So why this misnomer about NTAs? as a term for MRAs. And it's because this graphic to the uh, right shows the generation and transmission in silos, independent of each other. So there is um, a fallacy, I think, um, in this industry that transmission can be substituted for through generation investment or demand-side management um, uh, and vice versa. But I think it's actually much more common if we think about um, the realization of our integrated system that um, transmission investment motivates generation investment and generation investment as well serves as a catalyst for transmission investment. So today I wanted to share two examples with you and uh, these are examples that are actually real world applications. I'm not making up stylized case studies here and in fact in our white paper we talk about some other examples of um, investments we have seen that highlight the, the complementarity or the integrated nature of our grid system and um, present a different way to think about investment planning um, and making sure that we are considering MRAs on equal footing with transmission. So we have to the, I'm always confused, and it's not very clear, I see, either. But again, these slides will be available. But we have um, two case studies. One of them is in California. It's the Tehachapi Renewable Project. And another is in lovely Texas with the competitive renewable energy zones. In both instances, these transmission development projects were um, instilled in order to unlock and motivate new generation investment. So the transmission was a leader and a catalyst for generation investment. Um, uh, and um, in fact, when you think about the timing of the investments that need to take place, transmission, as we've heard today, takes five to 10 years to develop um, from initial idea through construction and permitting. Generation, on the other hand, um, can sometimes be developed on a much shorter time cycle. So we do need to think, if, if, if we're considering about who goes first, chicken or the egg, um, there's a natural order of things with transmission leading generation. Uh, the Tehachapi Project, if you're interested, there's a lot of information on the Cal ISO and Southern California Edison website, but effectively that project was meant to um, bring about, um, it started in 2004 and it's uh, nearing completion at this point, but it had a multi, multiple segments that meant, uh, that was gearing to bring 4,500 megawatts of new wind generation to market. And then the competitive uh, renewable energy zones in Texas was um, doing a similar thing with um, a slightly different scale, 18,000 megawatts of wind to market, some of which were already in the ground, but others that have developed since then. have started through legislation um, in, uh, uh, I believe, 2005, but really commenced in 2008 after the state regulator um, did a full um, cost-benefit, and well, I won't use the word full, but did a cost-benefit analysis of the options for transmission investment and um, um, approved a five billion plan, which actually turned into a seven billion, almost a seven billion um, investment strategy that is nearly complete as we talk here today. I was also going to spend a little bit of time talking about distributed generation because, again, a misnomer, perhaps a bit of an oversight in the, uh, in the industry, is that if we have distributed generation, we don't need transmission. We can all survive on the generation that we put on our homes and businesses. And I think a great, again, real-world case study of this is Germany. Um, Germany has had phenomenal growth in um, solar distributed generation through incentive schemes that they um, implemented through legislation in the um, early 2000s. Um, uh, literally, I think within the last five years, they've grown from a system that had zero 
megawatts of solar DG installed to over 30 gigawatts of capacity. They've had to now cap it at 52 gig gigawatts, but <laughs> that's a significant number when you think about the overall size of their system, which is only 190 gigawatts. So we're talking about a um, significant transformative change in that country. Um, but Solar DG isn't going to fuel the entire economy, and there's realization because of technical and economic reasons that they need other types of investment, and those other types of investments are really pairing the solar DG that individual households can deliver with new transmission investment. Based on the 10-year network plan that the European transmission owning entities do through a two-year cycle, they've identified over $30 billion in euro terms of expected new transmission investment for Germany alone. Uh, and a lot of that is being triggered by the need to uh, uh, distribute the distributed generation to different areas of the country and also to tap into offshore wind, which is a significant balancing source for the solar DG that uh, Germany is planning to use now that nuclear is being phased out in that country. So. A little bit on smart grid, but I won't stay very long here. I think um, very similar to DG, um, smart grid, as we've heard, it's, it's the ability to control, to monitor, to, to have access to information and digitally to integrate the information better between the consumer, all the appliances we use that consume electricity, and ultimately the network grid and the wholesale markets. Um, we're still struggling, but I think we have an image for what the future is going to hold, and uh, there's beautiful drawings and renditions that uh, um, uh, graphics artists and uh, um, forward thinkers have thought about how our homes would look with smart grid technology being deployed in the coming decades. But smart, um, smart grid technology doesn't mean that we're all going to disconnect from the grid. And in fact, the purpose of smart grid technology is to better integrate our consumption patterns with the system as a whole and provide a more efficient wholesale and retail market, kind of an, um, a convergence of those two with time. So now, finally, <laughs> getting to a couple of slides on the market resource alternatives. Um, what I've done here, and this is a, actually a, a figure that we had in that uh, September 2014 report, I've um, uh, laid out some of the technologies, market resource alternatives that we think of today, energy efficiency, demand response, uti utility scale generation, distributed generation, energy storage, and smart grid technologies deployed at the distribution level. and. Um, uh, one of the challenges that um, Jim had posed for our firm uh, when we started looking at market resource alternatives is to consider a way that you can actually evaluate those types of technologies on a level playing field with transmission. And for us, the first task really was to identify what we're talking about. What are the characteristics of market resource alternatives? And how do they line up with the characteristics of transmission? And um, as we went through and populated this grid with our understanding of the various technologies, I think one of the very important observations that we had is that um, each technology has its own services that it delivers to consumers. And those services may mean different types of actual products in the market, ancillary services, renewable attributes, energy capacity. It may also mean that Different technologies actually focus on a um, different geographical dimension. Some technologies like energy efficiency, demand response, distributed generation are really tailored to focusing on very narrow or small geographical areas, whereas um, uh, um, utility scale generation transmission is looking at much broader geographical areas. And so it goes with how the questions of how and when um, and um, other characteristics of these technologies. Um, bottom line, what we see is that in order to be able to evaluate MRAs on equal footing with transmission, the planning analysis um, needs to be able to recognize these unique characteristics for different technologies and evaluate them, monetize them, because I think dollars is a common denominator that speaks to many of these characteristics. So um, we also uh, through our analysis, 
wanted to um, introduce um, some guidelines, precepts as we call them, to thinking about the, that evaluation or planning process that we would be recommending um, in order to have um, a comprehensive and uh, robust consideration of the type of investments um, we would like to see in the future, both transmission and MRAs. And I think the first precept really speaks to my prior slide, which we would want to make sure that there is um, a similar objective set of criteria for looking at the economic benefits and technical reliability benefits of transmission and um, uh, in MRAs. And that would allow us then to have an effective uh, framework for looking at investment opportunities, one that's efficient, so we're making the best choices possible, one that's practical too, so that we can actually implement it, and non-discriminatory, which as we've heard today is a mainstay of the requirements that FERC has imposed on planning um, for some time. Other precepts in my six precept uh, list, which you can find in the, in the report, talk to the actual analytics uh, of thinking through how to go about and do this investment analysis. And they speak to comparability and ensuring also technical feasibility. Because in, in some cases, I think we get carried away. We see a new technology, we really want to have it, almost like we see a new iPhone and want to have that. And sometimes um, consideration of the technical reliability concerns that uh, presented themselves um, initially are, uh, are overlooked just for the sake of trying out something new. Um, and uh, with the transmission system, uh, reliability is almost like the first order constraint on this investment decision making process. We need to meet the reliability technical needs of the planning process first and foremost. And once we've decided how we meet that, that's when we then look at least cost and maximum benefit type of solutions to investment. Finally, if we go down my list um, of the precepts, just wanted to kind of rattle off a few more. Um, uh, I think um, number four is um, uh, fairly important, and as we showed in that uh, moon diagram, there are many different benefits and services that different MRAs and transmission can deliver to consumers. They're very situationally specific. We, we've done a very generic view, and I think those types of benefits, um, market services and non-market services, need to be evaluated thoroughly. And in some cases, I think um, for the sake of expediency, um, for the sake of simplicity and analysis, we overlook that type of um, comprehensiveness in looking at benefits and costs. Uh, finally, um, precept number five, or almost finally, precept number five, this is going back to that misconception or misnomer I talked about earlier between transmission and MRAs being perfect substitutes. Um, you know, that's really an artifact of us having moved away from integrated resource planning into the restructured environment where we have different entities participating in making investment de decisions in parallel. Um, but that's not to say that we can't have regional coordination. We, know, we can't have a vertically integrated utility anymore, but we could still have regional coordination. And I think um, it's important uh, when you build up the planning environment and the economic analysis that flows from it that um, as part of the regional coordination, you're looking at um, rational patterns of investment not just for the regulated entity, the transmission entity that's planning investment, but also from a variety of other stakeholders. You're looking at how generators would respond to transmission investment, whether they would actually build more generation. You're looking at uh, consumers and understanding the um, trends in distributed generation and energy efficiency and understanding how those link back to transmission investments that are made or not made. And I think with that rational, endogenous thinking, that's where we will actually get to a place where we can look at complementarity between investments. Um, I like to always say is that when we're setting up a, an analytical framework, uh, we get what we, we look for. So if we're looking for just substitutes and uh, choosing A versus B, that's the uh, the investment analysis will um, basically get us to that common denominator. But if our investment analysis is more comprehensive, um, more open-minded to the dynamic investment decisions we would expect in the longer term from the industry. That's an opportunity to really get to the 
um, uh, to a higher order solution for investment planning where we're building out um, uh, a number of different technologies, transmission, generation, uh, smart grid technologies. Um, and in looking at complementarities, we're basically taking into account what you may have heard in economic classes, things like positive externalities um, and um, incremental benefits that uh, we wouldn't otherwise identify. And uh, I think lastly, and just a, the, as a side way to explain precept no number six, Johannes pointed out uh, today that uh, planning is not about making, in my words, um, uh, it all work under normal conditions. Planning is really making the best decisions with information we have on hand. And in the way I think about it, those risks and uncertainties are really about the information we don't have on hand. And what we want to do is plan for that as well. And so um, it's very important to um, underscore that those uncertainties, our risks are represented within our planning methodology, not considered as an afterthought. So with that, thank you for your time today. Our, uh, our two uh, keynote speakers are here, and, uh, but uh, I think we have time for a couple of questions. Uh, Hannes. Uh, uh, Hannes and Julia be happy to uh, talk to you, of course, offline uh, after this panel, but uh, I, think, I think we'll just move on to, uh, to the main event here. So thank you very much. That was terrific. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'd like to introduce our keynote uh, speakers at lunch today. Uh, as you know, our time is uh, fairly compressed, and so uh, uh, if you do need to get up and get uh, some further lunch, please do so. But um, it's uh, it's very uh, it's it's a great honor and highly unusual that you get. Um, that you get uh, two distinguished uh, legislators, uh, both of whom have both a background uh, and a uh, and a desire to work in uh, the electricity or energy areas. Uh, our first speaker uh, is Senator Martin Heinrich, uh, who is a senator from New Mexico. He's a junior senator from New Mexico. 
Uh, I just learned something very interesting from him, and that is his father was a lineman. And he kind of grew up in the utility environment. Um, he's, uh, uh, he is on the uh, Energy and Natural Resources Committee, quite appropriately, as well as uh, the Intelligence Committee and Joint Economic Committee. Uh, I think that uh, he's spoken recently at uh, other conferences with our, our uh, friends uh, at the Americans for a Clean Energy Grid, uh, and um, uh, he understands the issues that we are all grappling with in this period of great change. Um, he is uh, also a committed advocate for New Mexico's middle class families, a champion for uh, the burgeoning clean energy economy, and New Mexico has some wonderful resources in that regard, uh, and, a, uh, and a protector of, uh, of our public lands. Uh, he's the only engineer in the Senate, uh, and so he brings a unique perspective to creating good, sustainable jobs and protecting the vital missions of our national laboratories, uh, particularly Sandia, um, which our other speaker happened to work at at one time. So this is uh, this is a, a, a great uh, a great uh, harmonic convergence we've got going here. Um, uh, I, I'm uh, I'm delighted and honored to introduce to you. Uh, Senator Martin Heinrich from New Mexico. Thank you, Jim. Um, it's certainly an honor to be here today and to join you to talk about how uh, we build a robust 21st century transmission infrastructure that reflects all the changes that Jim just alluded to from cleaner sources, dealing with intermittency, managing that uh, storage that's coming on rapidly uh, from the horizon, and power controls that are just simply a light year away from you know what my father experienced as a lineman back in the 1980s, uh, when he would oftentimes walk lines for miles looking to see, uh, you know, to, to manually inspect switches and other controls. So things are really changing rapidly right now. Um, and oh, I should correct one thing uh, for the record because my bio is a little out of date. There are now two engineers in the Senate. Uh, so Steve Daines from Montana is a chemical engineer. So we're making progress, but it is slow. Um, but customers are now generators. I mean, myself included, for the last 10 years, uh, you know, I've been putting electrons into the grid and taking electrons out of the grid. And the industry certainly has new responsibilities uh, with respect to cybersecurity in, in particular to provide not only advanced control technologies but improved security as well. So I want to commend WIRES for hosting this event to bring folks together to seek pragmatic solutions and innovative opportunities and to gain a better understanding of why transmission infrastructure is so critical to our economy. And I want to start out by pointing out uh, Dr. Dan Alpert from my office, who's in the back corner. Uh, if, you, uh, if you haven't gotten to know him and you're working on these issues in any way that, that touches us natural, uh, nationally or with uh, New Mexico in particular in the Southwest, please get to know him. Uh, he has forgotten more things about this field than, uh, than I know. Um, so we, we try to put him to work on these issues on a regular basis. And uh, I want to thank Jim for just inviting me today, and to everyone who made this event possible, thank you. Many of the important developments in regional transmission over the past 20 years are really a direct result of the things that Jim got started as FERC chairman. And I also want to recognize my colleague, who um, I, I'm going to try to not do the faux pas. Ike Skelton used to introduce me sometimes as a gentleman from Coal Camp, Missouri, because when I was a little kid, I lived in his district in Missouri. So I'm not going to quite do that with Jerry, but there was a time when Jerry worked at Sandia National Laboratories in New Mexico, and we, uh, we still count him as one of our own, uh, not just as a New Mexican, but as somebody who really understands these technical issues, and we need a lot more folks like that in the House of Representatives and in the Senate, and it's always uh, a pleasure not just to share a stage with Jerry, but to work with him. So you've got a great lineup of speakers who are really at the forefront of this innovation and who are focused 
uh, like myself on unlocking America's clean power potential. And certainly energy is really at the heart of almost every issue across the country. And it's a cornerstone in my home state of New Mexico. We are certainly an energy exporter on many fronts. And as a member of the Senate Committee on Energy and Natural Resources, I'm supporting a number of proposals right now to help expand both traditional and renewable domestic energy production. However, it's going to take a lot more than any one policy or one initiative or any one law to transition our nation and the planet uh, from the energy of yesterday to the energy of tomorrow. And certainly given the current polarization, which, you know, knock on wood, we're seeing a few cracks in, um, in Congress, I don't have to tell you that it's not going to be easy, but it is going to be absolutely critical for our future. The transition of our nation's power generation portfolio to more efficient and cleaner technologies is already well underway and will surely accelerate as new regulations like the Clean Power Plan are implemented. But there's a big disconnect right now between transmission access and the best geographic renewable energy sources. And there should be no doubt that full utilization of our renewable potential will only be possible when we have the transmission capacity in place to deliver that power to market. Our system of power transmission and federal regulation were really designed for an era that no longer exists. Uh, when I was growing up, you know, I didn't oftentimes didn't even realize how much of a utility brat I was. I had a yellow t-shirt that said, I turn on after seven. That was, that was the campaign to try to deal with uh, peak uh, generation challenges in the, in the 1970s. And used to draw little ready kilowatts when I'd hang out at my, my dad's office. But in those days, electrons sort of flowed from your, your central generation out through the transmission lines to the distribution lines and then out to businesses and homes. And it was a one-way street. Um, the development of an interconnected transmission network, regional transmission operators, independent power producers, distributed generation, um, soon I think distributed en energy storage, using the grid in a way that no one foresaw just a couple of decades ago is the new reality. And at the same time, the Federal Power Act is now 80 years old and is increasingly limiting in the full development of robust markets, for energy power in interstate commerce, and certainly limiting in terms of uh, you know, the, the kind of time management that we, we need to have in place today. So we need to work together to ensure that the regulatory structure is in place so that priority transmission projects can be sited and built. And I don't need to tell any of you what a challenge that has been. In New Mexico, building new transmission and modernizing our existing electrical grid is central to becoming a state where our potential for new generation projects and our reality actually meet. And according to the U.S. Solar Insight 2014 year in review, New Mexico was 10th in the nation last year for added solar capacity, about 88 megawatts of new solar, bringing our total to about 325 megawatts. Uh, not bad for a state of 2 million people. I mean, that's 75,000 new homes, but nowhere near our total capacity. And when you add in the potential we have for wind on the east side of the state that is currently stranded, it is a substantial wasted resource. Um, we should be a major exporter of electrical power, even beyond what we're doing now. And we can spur substantial additional renewable energy development by adding that transmission capacity that will allow us to export clean energy to markets in Arizona and in Congressman McNerney's state. Um, and while we're at it, the benefits are manifold. Uh, for one, we have uh, had a real dip in construction jobs in recent years since the Great Recession of 2008-2009. Uh, the number of construction jobs would be substantial and many new permanent jobs associated <laughs> Uh, not just with the construction of new generation, but the operations and maintenance of new generation. But the reality is that regional planning for transmission just has not developed in the West the way it has in the East and the Midwest United States. And other than California, most of the West does not have competitive markets for electric power generation. 
Though the regional transmission organizations are developing in much of the rest of the country, the large distances and the low population densities in the West have been a real challenge. Uh, the Western Interconnection can count dozens of individual balancing authorities that manage the operation of the local transmission grid. The development of the new short-term energy imbalance market in the West is one positive step forward uh, that will help to better integrate intermittent resources like solar and wind into the marketplace. Uh, but we have a long way to go before we're managing uh, intermittent sources at the level of, say, Germany. Uh, which has really shown what is possible uh, to do in terms of uh, managing very high penetration levels of renewables even in the midst of a solar eclipse. So we need to improve the overall transmission, siding, permitting, and review process if we're going to get there, ensuring that transmission projects get timely regulatory approvals, especially when there are multiple jurisdictions involved, which seems like always, is, is just critical to realizing our true potential. So FERC has played a strong leadership role already with its Order 1000, setting the rules of the road on regional transmission planning and cost allocation. And I'll also add that we're lucky to have Norman Bay as the new chair of FERC. Uh, he is, in my view, an outstanding public servant with extensive experience to address the challenges that we face in our country right now. He gets extra points in my book, not only because he's from New Mexico, but because he's an ardent fly fisherman. Um, but I'm also confident that Chairman Bay will continue to judiciously implement the law focused on FERC's statutory responsibilities of energy infrastructure, competitive markets, and reliability. And I would hazard to guess that Chairman Bay's tenure will see changes in the adoption of both central and distributed storage on a scale analogous to the recent changes that we've seen in the last few years with solar generation. With his leadership, I know that FERC will be well positioned to navigate, implement, and manage that change. Additionally, the administration has established a clearinghouse to try and streamline approvals on federal land. And in those few cases when the responsible state regulatory bodies cannot come to agreement, on a priority project that has been selected as part of FERC's 1000, Order 1000 process, Congress, Congress should establish an option for developers to seek approval directly from FERC. This idea has been talked about for a long time. Congress took a crack at it back in 2005 in the last energy bill. Uh, there was litigation. Things didn't quite work out as planned. But today, I am pleased to announce that I've introduced legislation that will provide transmission siting authority at FERC as a backstop in the rare case where states have been unable to act on priority projects. The bill amends the 1935 Federal Power Act to provide FERC narrow authority to approve and site new electrical transmission lines. The siting authority would only apply to regional transmission projects that serve multiple entities and where the costs are to be shared among the entities. Under FERC's Order 1000, each public utility transmission provider must participate in a regional transmission planning process and produce a regional transmission plan. Order 1000 also requires transmission providers to develop methods for allocating those costs of new transmission facilities among those who will either use or benefit from them. Currently, developers of new priority regional transmission projects must seek approval from local or state authorities to site and construct their projects. My bill would allow FERC to step in and provide backstop authority, but only after local or state approval has been, uh, is not provided within one year, and in cases where a state simply does not have the legal authority to consider or approve a project under existing state law. FERC would also have to first determine that the proposal, uh, proposed project is in the public interest and advances public policy goals, including supporting the development of new cleaner power generation, reducing emissions like carbon pollution, or enhancing competition and reliability. FERC would be required to conduct a full public process to review the project and perform all required federal authorizations, such as those under NEPA, 
uh, and the use um, those under NEPA and for the use of any federal lands, including uh, tribal land. This siting authority wouldn't apply to Alaska and Hawaii, which um, at least currently don't connect to any other states. But it's my hope that the Energy Committee will consider this bill this year. And additionally, today, uh, as we know, the administration is releasing the first uh, quadrennial energy review. Someday I'm going to learn how to say quadrennial easily. Uh, but which will include recommendations on energy infrastructure, including transmission. And while I have just started to dig into that, I am hopeful that that will be another tool for advancing uh, the rapid change that, that we're all struggling with right now. I understand that you're going to have a session today as well on cybersecurity, which is also one of those issues that Congress should be acting on soon. Uh, one area I believe Congress should consider is providing the Secretary of Energy Emergency Authority to protect the nation's electric transmission grid from an imminent cybersecurity threat. Currently, no individual is clearly designated to take immediate actions to protect the United States from a possible national security th threat to the electrical grid or to respond in the case of that kind of an emergency. Now, modernizing our nation's electrical grid isn't just about new jobs or harnessing clean energy potential or, for that matter, reducing the risk of energy disruptions due to cyber attack. It's also at its root about dealing with the challenges that we currently face with regard to climate change. Uh, I am of the opinion that it is our moral obligation to lead the world and not be a follower uh, with regard to the climate crisis. Uh, certainly the world is looking to us for leadership. And if you come from a state like I do, you wrestle with the fact that these things are no longer theoretical. Uh, the stubbornness of the challenges that we have faced in the last few years are very, very difficult to ignore in my home state. We are seeing dramatically different fire behavior. Uh, we're seeing very different seasons. Um, our humidity levels are lower, our temperatures are higher, and we're dealing with changes that we've seen, we have just never experienced in the past. Uh, over the past four years, in fact, we have seen the two single largest fires in New Mexico's history. And with elevated temperatures, studies at Los Alamos National Labs predict that three quarters, literally three quarters of our evergreen forests in New Mexico could be gone by as early as 2050, a radically different place than the one I live in today. At the same time, in the past several years, we've experienced some of the driest periods on record since records were started in the state. And at the heart of this, it's simply irresponsible for us not to take concrete steps to begin to address these challenges. Uh, we cannot pass on 100 percent of the burden for this to our kids. But we have the technology, and we have the resources, we have the human capital, <laughs> Uh, and I know that through American ingenuity, we will unleash the full potential of clean, homegrown energy and put a lot of Americans to work while we do it. I'm a strong believer that innovation is what America is literally best at. And in fact, I think the very character of our nation has been shaped by hard work and innovation over and over again. That's the American story. We're going to have to embrace the challenge of addressing climate change. We're going to lead the world in clean energy and make modernization of our electrical transmission infrastructure a priority in this country again. And I hope that all of you will see me as a partner as we, uh, uh, as we face those very challenging challenges in front of us. So thank you again for having me today. Yeah. The senator will take uh, take a question or two. Um, um, yes, sir. So I want to ask you, given how close the state is right across to you guys, and you want to export your energy, mm -hmm. how would you convince Texas to actually get into work and you know get energy from you guys? Are you going to <laughs> right now, um, we have ready markets to the west. And so the short-term uh, play is to be able to move generation 
to Arizona and California. The long-term play is to see an interconnect uh, with Texas. And the timing of all of that is, is relative, too, because there are uh, competitive issues between the two states as well uh, in terms of, of cost uh, and when some of that generation comes into play. So I think our, what we're staring at right now, the, the most immediate opportunities, are to be able to, to uh, uh, create new generation that will flow to the West. In the long term, I think we'll be uh, producing generation that will be able to wheel back and forth between the Texas grid and New Mexico. Other questions? Let, let, let me ask uh, what your timetable is for, for this legislation, because we'd love to help in any way we can. Well, I think the, uh, the first thing I would simply ask is that if you have an opportunity to speak to other folks on the committee, uh, the chair and others, please encourage them to take a look at the bill. Uh, we're going to be asking them to schedule a hearing, and that's always a critical first step. Uh, and be in contact with us if you have suggestions for uh, who we might have um, as uh, uh, who could testify yes. at that uh, that hearing. Yes, ma'am. My concern is environmental considerations. I think you guys have the sure. Sure. Well, I think I think NEPA does a good job of accounting for that, and there are a number of other rules in place, uh, and and we've actually been able to, in the state of New Mexico, if you look at a number of the transmission projects that are on the table. Um, the portions that have gone through my state, I'm very proud of the siding that's gone on there. I can't speak to whether, you know, that's always been the case in other places. They aren't straight lines. Obviously, the developers would love them to be straight lines. But we've been able to navigate around wilderness areas, wilderness study areas, national wildlife refuges, um, other natural features that are really critical to, uh, to my home state. And I think it's worth looking at those. It's just like wind energy. I'm all for wind energy, but you don't you don't cite a uh, wind generation um, uh, a wind generation facility in the middle of a flyway. Um, so we have to be thoughtful about where we put these things. Uh, that's not trivial, but it's certainly also not impossible. Thank you very much. We really appreciate. It. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator. Uh, we have uh, uh, a, a uh, double header here. Uh, the Honorable uh, Jerry McNerney is with us. He is a five term congressman from California. Uh, and uh, and uh, one reason we are delighted he's here is he is a co founder of the uh, House of Representatives Caucus on uh, Grid Innovation, uh, the Grid Innovation Caucus. And um, uh, he has a, a background also in New Mexico, which uh, well, we didn't plan that, but um, uh, he uh, has an extraordinarily ap uh, appropriate um, uh, personal history for for this kind of industry, this kind of uh, conversation that we're having. Um, he is a, uh, uh, a, has a doctorate in biophysics uh, from UC Davis. Uh, he is a, uh, uh, an extraordinary uh, uh, mathematician and engineer. Um, I should read part of this because it is quite amazing. Before and immediately after graduating, uh, from the University of Mexico, New Mexico. Uh, he spent several years working on renewable energy and national security programs as a contractor at Sandia, 
Uh, and after leaving Sandy, he spent two decades in a variety of positions as a developer of renewable energy projects. So uh, a lot of what we're talking about today, um, he has a very personal uh, uh, knowledge of. Uh, and, uh, and he is, uh, of course, on the Energy and Commerce Committee uh, of the House, where he has helped to put together a very bipartisan emphasis on the future uh, of the grid. So it's, it's indeed my pleasure again uh, uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, introduce uh, the Honorable Jerry McNerney of California. Well, good afternoon. Uh, it's, it's really a pleasure to be here, and I want to thank the Senator for his kind words. Um, Senator uh, Heinrich and I were colleagues for a few years in the House, and uh, we both uh, have a very strong engineering background, have a lot of passion about this area, and I hope that that comes through today. Uh, I also want to uh, acknowledge my former colleague, uh, Mike Ross, uh, who's a part of the organization here today. He was also a member of the Energy and Commerce Committee, uh, and um, someone that uh, was very bipartisan and willing to work together, so it's a pleasure to see you here today, Mike. Um, well, you guys are the nuts and bolts of the transmission industry, and that is uh, a big part of the grid. It's a big part of uh, what anybody that wants to do something with uh, electric power has to deal with and manage in one way or another. Uh, my background, um, as mentioned, I spent about 20 years in the industry creating new, uh, new uh, wind energy technology, uh, new solar, uh, new um, uh, residential metering technology at EPRI and so on. So I'm, I'm fairly familiar with the industry from, from an employment perspective. And I just want to tell you a little story about uh, my first days in the business. Uh, I, I went to Massachusetts to work for a company that created wind turbines. Uh, and we got, a, we got some investment money uh, in order to design a wind turbine on a blank sheet of paper. So we started from scratch. Uh, we designed a, a beautiful wind turbine. Uh, we had it manufactured, uh, we had the components manufactured and put them together in our shop uh, and it was just something of, of real pride for all of us. Um, we got to plant that thing in the hills of New Hampshire where it was nice and windy and nice and cold most of the time. Uh, we went out there, uh, invited investors out there to, to see the maiden voyage. Uh, we turned it on and then, man, the blades just started flying and everyone was running for cover. So that was, that's a good way to impress your investors, but it got them emotionally uh, involved as well. So, uh, but you know, the thing is that, uh, and it's like the, it's like the transmission uh, business. We, we, we looked at the problems, we looked at the blade roots, how do we make those secure? How do we make the bearings uh, last long? Uh, how do we make the generators cost effective? Uh, what do you do to make the, the, uh, the foundation secure without spending a ton of concrete? All these things year after year, incremental improvements uh, and until uh, wind industry is now a very, uh, very successful, it's very cost effective uh, and it's, it's leading the world in, in generation in some parts of the, uh, of the world. So uh, it's just a matter of sticking with it, uh, you know, having confidence in your engineering, engineering ability uh, and making it happen. So, uh, I, I think you all can relate to that story in one way or another. Uh, and in the wind industry, uh, where I spent most of my career, um, you really rely on transmission. As Martin pointed out uh, with his uh, comment on stranded assets in eastern New Mexico, there's some really good wind uh, energy resource in this country, in the Dakotas, in, in that whole uh, uh, line uh, from the country, from the Dakotas all the way down through New Mexico and Texas. Uh, and yet that we don't have the transmission ca capacity uh, to install that, that wind energy. So uh, there's, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of opportunity still in the business. If, if you think you've uh, run up uh, against the wall, no, there's plenty of opportunity out there. Um, and that's why I wanted to start uh, the Bipartisan uh, Grid Innovation Caucus. Uh, my co-chair is Renee Elmers. Uh, she's a, a Republican from uh, North Carolina. Uh, and uh, I can tell you, if you watch the news, it looks like Washington is a place where people are always fighting. Uh, and the newsworthy items, uh, are they're newsworthy because we're fighting on those items. But there's plenty of other issues that we're able to work on, and this is one of them. Uh, our caucus has uh, 20 to 25 members now, very bipartisan. Uh, we're working with utilities across the country to, uh, to get ideas out there uh, in terms of engaging my, my colleagues. 
Uh, I think that's the biggest challenge is to uh, see that my colleagues uh, in the House and maybe in the Senate understand the challenges uh, and the excitement in this industry uh, and, and the opportunities. So uh, we're working together. Um, PG&E was out here and made me get up in one of those those uh, man cups over there. It was all electric. It wasn't uh, gas powered. So that was that was a lot of fun. Uh, Miss Elmer's had a skirt on, so she didn't want to get up there. But it, it was um, it was a quite an experience, and, and we do those kind of things all the time. So uh, I just uh, uh, we're going to focus on uh, transmission and distribution, cyber and physical security, which is uh, very important as we've seen. Um, um, and how how can Congress, how can we in Congress be effective in, in, in developing policy that will help this industry move forward? Uh, and when we do that, there's several things we need to take into uh, uh, consideration. Uh, Martin mentioned the uh, citing issue. Well, citing is very important, and I appreciate his, his, uh, his legislative proposal. Uh, we'll have to take a look at that in the House and see if that's something we can move forward. Um, Having a, 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 a supply of skilled labor also very, very important. Uh, and that that um, depends on some of our educational policies. Um, the integration of renewables, how are we going to uh, integrate renewables? Uh, Martin, when, when, Mr. when Senator Heidreich sat down, the first thing he asked me was, are you as excited about storage as I am? Well, yes, I'm very excited about storage. Uh, it's expensive, but there's uh, innovations coming along, uh, and I think we're going to see some breakthroughs uh, that will make storage cost effective uh, within the next decade or so. Uh, we ought to start planning how to in integrate that and to use that um, technology uh, to uh, meet the goals that Senator Heinrich was referring to in terms of uh, climate change, um, which we're all facing. Um, we want to make sure that investors get a return. Uh, you don't want to uh, have a system out there where, where people can invest uh, their dollars and, and not have some sort of um, uh, confidence that they're going to get that return uh, or else it won't happen as you know uh, we need regional planning another issue that Martin touched on heavily and we also need to look at the wheeling rules how, how are we going to wheel are we going to want to put in a, a 721 overlay or are we going to want to depend on uh, distributed generation I mean those are very d d difficult questions um, the, the overlay issue uh, I think is complicated because it seems like it's good. You can generate power at one part of the country, ship it to another. But then uh, if you do that, people in New England are going to say, well, you know, we can produce wind energy, but we can't compete with coal uh, from, from Wyoming. So uh, we have these regional issues to, to consider when we, when we talk about uh, large-scale uh, high-voltage overlays uh, for our transmission system in this country. Um, of course... Uh, the, the goal of all this is, is reliable, uh, cost-effective, resilient, and regionally effective uh, electrical transmission. Um, <clears throat> we need to know, uh, we need to get some idea, uh, and I hope we can continue to discuss this in the Grid uh, Innovation Caucus, where is our electrical grid heading? Um, how are we going to start planning uh, for the challenges, uh, and can we plan for the challenges? Do we do we need economic models? Do we need better load flow models? I mean, how are we going to uh, understand all that? How are we going to get the resources out there for you all to actually uh, take those, those challenges on? Um, superconductors. Does anybody feel strongly about superconductors? I mean, uh, there is technology out there. The uh, superconductor temperatures are um, as high as minus 100 degrees or something. I don't know exactly, but uh, if we can get superconductors out there, uh, you know the story about losses. You know the story about heat. Uh, if we can get superconductor transmission out there, that would be an incredible boom for our country. Uh, we create a lot of employment. Uh, and as you know, uh, the footprint for a, a superconductor transmission is, is really only going to be about uh, six feet uh, laterally uh, as opposed to about uh, 50 feet for, for transmission lines. So. Um, you know, we have a lot of opportunity out there in terms of technology. Switching gear, that's something that we developed uh, in, in, our, uh, in our wind in, uh, industry. Uh, we had these uh, generators uh, that tend to be induction generators, uh, utilities like synchronous generation. Uh, we need to be able to control the power factor because we had transmission, uh, we had generation that was way out uh, in the boonies. Nobody wants to live near... Uh, those, well, not nobody, but not many people want to live in extremely windy sites, so uh, we had to transmit uh, power 
uh, pretty good distances, which means we're having power factor changes, so we could either lead or lag. Uh, and, and we developed the, the switching technology to, to follow uh, the sinusoidal uh, um, um, current distribution we needed on that. So uh, that uh, sort of technology is going to have to extend even more to the transmission facilities because we want to make sure that our transmission lines uh, can cut off uh, quickly to avoid system-wide uh, disruptions. Uh, we want to be able to, to use the, uh, the, the, the electrical uh, energy we have efficiently and so on. So uh, there's an opportunity for that sort of technology. Um, and uh, <clears throat> I guess, uh, as Martin pointed out, we're going to work closely with FERC uh, and NERC. Uh, he mentioned their orders uh, 1,000, but we also have the 764 and the 890. So uh, there's plenty of involvement. Uh, there's plenty of opportunity for uh, involvement between the Congress and the regulatory agencies that are uh, managing uh, the business. Um, <clears throat> And uh, as, as Martin mentioned, as I got questioned earlier, uh, the quadrennial energy review just came out. I haven't had a time uh, to really dig into it either, but I think it's going to give us an opportunity uh, to sort of point us in the right direction uh, how, uh, of how to address some of these big problems. Um, the Energy and Commerce Committee now uh, is working on a bipartisan uh, way uh, to develop a new a comprehensive uh, energy package that will uh, address some of these issues like um, like uh, return on investment uh, and so on that'll help you all move forward in this industry um, and uh, I hope to uh, to get some feedback from you all uh, in this process uh, as this as this new uh, legislative package is introduced there's going to be a lot of questions there's going to be a lot of uh, opportunity for you all to to chime in and tell us what uh, is going to work and what isn't going to work and how we can make this uh, the most effective uh, legislation possible in this environment. Um, and again, um, I want to thank you all for allowing me to address you this morning. I just want to say um, uh, I, I live in California. Normally I come back uh, early flight on the day of votes. Today is the day of votes, uh, first day of votes this week. Uh, but because I had an opportunity to come here and meet some of you fine folks, I decided to come back a day early. So it just uh, tells you how enthusiastic I am about this bit. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I can take a couple of questions. Okay. okay. Uh, questions uh, for the congressman? Well, uh, uh, I guess the, the question that's certainly on my mind is uh, what is the agenda of the uh, Grid Innovation Caucus, uh, and you see some some natural issues coming out of your uh, bipartisan efforts uh, anytime soon. Well, the, I mean, the the real uh, the real goal in my mind is to. Uh, to establish a forum so that we can discuss what legislation will be useful, but also uh, to get people excited about it because we're going to be doing these demonstrations. We want uh, some of my colleagues to get out there and see what's going on, to meet some of the players in the industry. Uh, so it's as much uh, of, a, of an opportunity to get people excited in sort of a PR way uh, as it is a policy uh, forum. So I think the two objectives will be uh, what I have in mind, I think my colleague uh, and co-founder a co-chair also feels the same way. Well, I would make the same offer that I made to the senator. We'd, we'd be delighted uh, if you'd call on us for, uh, for uh, our input and expertise. We have quite an array of, uh, of, uh, of technologically astute people here. Thank you. Be glad to. Are there other questions? Yes, ma'am. Uh, what approach would you like to <laughs> Well, that's uh, cybersecurity is one of those uh, really hard to get your hands on issues. I mean, there's uh, there's three or four aspects. There's the uh, the data breach notification uh, part of it. There's data sharing. I think there's a data sharing uh, bill going to be marked up uh, and voted on relatively soon. We had a uh, a data breach notification markup in the House um, last week. It was it was relatively bipartisan, um, and uh, I think um, the the members of the majority. Uh, listen to the members of the minority. Uh, they didn't accept our, our proposals exactly, but uh, they certainly have promised to work with us in finding a, a compromise solution, which is important because 
if it doesn't have a compromise solution coming out of the House, it's not really going to go anywhere uh, in the Senate or the White House. So that's important. Uh, the other uh, part of that is data security. How do we make sure that our data is secure? Uh, and then if you look at your uh, part in that question, uh, data security for, for transmission companies, uh, for, for utility companies, is a bit of a different question than it would be for healthcare uh, companies, uh, health insurance companies, or uh, for banks, or for credit card companies. So every sector, uh, every, every part of the economic, uh, every sector of our economy is going to have to look at what it's going to take to make uh, their data secure and make their customers have confidence that their data is secure. Uh, and then once we understand what that is, uh, what those requirements are going to be, I think we're going to be able to be in a position to, to legislate what's needed and uh, get the uh, Federal um, Communication Commission uh, and Federal Trade Commission to enforce those rules. So uh, we have still a big challenge, uh, but it's a necessary and it's an urgent challenge. Uh, we see that there's an opportunity uh, with some specific sorts of cyber attacks to uh, to destroy perhaps some of our uh, of our um, uh, um, uh, tra uh, our uh, transformers uh, and so on. So uh, we need to ur act urgently, um, and uh, legislation is moving forward, uh, at least on data breach uh, and data sharing. And we need to get something more solid on on uh, on data security as soon as we can. One more. current mood in Congress would be to uh, provide a, uh, um, uh, a situation where there's a return on, in, on the, in the research investment in the private sector through tax breaks or, or other means rather than trying to, uh, to, to fund. Although uh, I'm, I'm certainly in favor of, of providing the De Department of Energy money uh, to grant money to do research. I think the mood of the Congress is, is more in, in terms of uh, letting the private sector do it. So. Uh, the, the vehicle would be to make sure that there's tax return on investment on that. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. We are not going to waste any time. I th believe uh, our next uh, panelists are here. I, I see Joe and um, Assistant Secretary Durkovich, I believe, is, uh, okay. Um, is our, our web person here, we can go back to our, Oh, is it? Oh, okay, okay. I thought we had a different uh, thumb drive. All right, great, great. All right, we're going to, that's the perfect segue. The congressman uh, was talking about uh, cybersecurity and legislation, and uh, Assistant Secretary uh, for Infrastructure Protection um, at, uh, at Homeland Security uh, is, is going to uh, talk a little bit about what the government's uh, responsibilities and activities are in that area. Uh, Caitlin Durkovich is... Uh, um, uh, Assistant Secretary for Infra Infrastructure Protection, 
the National Protection and Programs Director at the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. Um, that, uh, I suspect, is an enormously complicated and responsible uh, uh, job. Uh, she uh, uh, she uh, leads the department uh, in uh, strengthening public-private partnerships and coordinating programs to protect the nation's critical infrastructure, uh, assess and mitigate risk, uh, build resilience, which is very important for the power grid, of course, and strengthen uh, incident response and recovery. Uh, she has many years of experience at Homeland Security and, and in, um, in related positions. Started out at Booz Allen. Uh, she's, uh, ironically, was born and raised in New Mexico. This is, I don't know what's going on here, but uh, a graduate of Duke University uh, and uh, uh, has a has a, a, a an incredibly uh, 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 great background for the job she holds. Uh, she and uh, and Joe uh, uh, Detzel are going to talk about cybersecurity, and we frankly haven't given them nearly enough time on this subject on this program today. So you know who they are, and uh, we'll give you their home phone numbers, but. Um, <laughs> Uh, we we want to make sure that this subject matter gets a uh, a lot of attention. Joe, uh, and I'll go ahead and introduce him now, has more than 20 years of IT and cyber security experience. He's the uh, Chief Information Security Officer and Head of Cyber Security at ABB Enterprise Software. Um, uh, this is so far above my pay grade, I can't tell you, but... Joe is, uh, is uh, uh, working on uh, a lot of uh, security issues relative to uh, public utilities and has spent a lot of time uh, working in, in the electric utility industry, including on uh, NERC's SIP standards uh, and, uh, 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 and rather than belabor the subject, let me turn it over to the Assistant Secretary and uh, and we will look forward to hearing your remarks. Great. Uh, thank you very much, uh, and good afternoon, everyone. It's wonderful uh, to be here. It is a glorious day uh, outside, and so if you have a chance to go outside and uh, just enjoy the sun and the flowers, and if you have allergies, I'm sure that hampers it, but it's certainly uh, pretty nice out there. Um, I am delighted to be here today. And what I would like to do is, is talk to you about um, our relationship uh, with the electric sector uh, and, frankly, um, the other critical infrastructure sectors, uh, why my office does what it does, uh, and to provide you with um, kind of a broad look at the range of threats and hazards uh, that can impact uh, the electric sector and, frankly, other sectors. And then I'll let Joe really do um, the deep dive into um, the, cyber, the cyber part of it. Um, so my office at uh, the Department of Homeland Security, the Office of Infrastructure Protection, is an office that is organic to the Department of Homeland Security. It is not one of the 22 different departments and agencies that transferred out of other uh, departments and agencies to form uh, DHS, but it was established with the recognition that at the end of the day uh, on 9-11, terrorists weaponized critical infrastructure uh, and flew it into uh, iconic buildings, which are also uh, considered critical infrastructure. And that at the end of the day, the majority of our nation's critical infrastructure is not owned or operated by the federal government, but is in fact owned and operated um, by the private sector and other uh, unique uh, ownership uh, arrangements, um, some of them municipal, but you know, complex, but again, not necessarily owned um, by the federal government. And that it was incumbent on us uh, as the federal government to work with those owners and operators to help them understand, and at that time, at post 9-11, really the threats uh, that could disrupt uh, their, uh, their infrastructure and their operations and thereby impact um, both national security but economic security and prosperity as well, to help them understand those threats and hazards and then to work with them to uh, develop tools uh, and programs uh, to to mitigate uh, to mitigate that risk and so really over the course of um, the last dozen years that's uh, a good part of what my office has 
has been doing is working to develop those trusted relationship with the owners and operators of critical infrastructure and again um, to help them change this or understand this evolving risk environment and I think that's an interesting thing as I kind of set up the what are the things that we're worried about today is that it has the world post since post 9-11 has evolved and we remain very concerned about the threats um, from our adversaries um, we've certainly uh, you know, Al Qaeda remains one of our main um, concerns, but the, the the terrorism front is changing, and with the rise of ISIL, um, we are con um, increasingly concerned about uh, domestic terrorism, uh, violent extremism here on on U.S. soil, and the impact that 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 can have on our critical infrastructure. But we're equally concerned um, about um, increasingly extreme weather. We're uh, concerned about. Uh, cyber threats, and so really the range of risks uh, and threats and hazards that a, a utility and a critical infrastructure owner and operator has to worry about um, is is growing and increasing. And so we spend a lot of time again looking um, at these threats and hazards, um, helping them understand what is the probability, what is the likelihood, and how do you craft a security posture, a resilience posture that accounts for these, these range of, of threats and hazards. Um, we divide the world into 16 um, sectors. Uh, the energy sector is one of them, and under energy you have oil and natural gas, uh, and you have electric power, uh, as well as pipelines, there's water, uh, there's transportation, there's commercial facilities, there's the chemical sector. I don't wanna go through all 16 sectors other than to um, state that in the last few years we have begun to recognize that of those 16 sectors there are um, a few of what we call lifeline sectors that we recognize that without um, these key critical infrastructure functions it would be hard to do what you do on a daily basis uh, and so in particular uh, those are um, electricity water uh, telecommunications and transportation and think about what you do in your daily life and if you took one of those if one of those stopped functioning if you couldn't access uh, the internet if you couldn't make a phone call if there was no power right if there was no water how hard it would be to do uh, what you do on a daily basis well the reality is all of those critical functions underpin um, our economy and the functioning of our American way of life so we um, work very closely with those functions in particular, again, to help them understand what are the range of things that can disrupt um, their operations and, and how can we mitigate uh, that risk. Um, so what I wanna focus on is two things. One is what are um, the specific threats and hazards um, that again could disrupt the electric um, industry, but equally important, the recognition that that particular critical uh, infrastructure function is dependent on other these other lifeline functions and then as we work with owners and operators it's not only helping them understand what is going to disrupt their own operations but they are, there are dependencies and interdependencies both in their supply chain um, but across the critical infrastructure landscape where a disruption in uh, in for example the water sector can actually impact how how an electric utility operates and so as much as we're focused on terrorism and on uh, natural hazards we're also very focused on the ecosystem of critical infrastructure itself and how disruption can have cascading uh, impacts so um, when you look specifically at the range of threats and hazards that can disrupt the electric industry they are far-reaching uh, and it is everything from vandalism and theft, um, there is a lot of copper that you'll find on substations, and uh, you have junkies who uh, have made it um, a habit, uh, no pun intended, to um, go out and they try and mine that copper that you find uh, in a substation and they can go sell it, um, and they can make some money and they can go you know, buy drugs. Uh, that is, as we see as many of those incidents as anything else, but you have stupid people who are doing these things and sometimes when they're going and stealing um, copper, you know, they cause disruptions. Um, so it ranges fr from something as unsophisticated as copper theft to the very sophisticated and what we see on the cyber side from attacks on um, control systems to um, an adversary that is increasingly attuned to the fact that um, you, um, you can 
um, disrupt uh, communications and you can cut fiber lines and that can impact um, how the, the transmission and the distribution system works as well. And I'm going to talk a little bit more um, about that. But uh, it's also natural hazards. Uh, and I would say, um, you know, we're all very aware of how a storm like Hurricane Sandy or Hurricane Katrina um, can disrupt power, but um, we're in, in, and the industry itself, I think, has become, um, it's very resilient and it learns from these lessons and that overall, uh, it is well um, suited to handle what I have, what, what I would call kind of high frequency, um, but increasingly low impact storms. We've gotten used to hurricanes in this country, uh, and most of the utilities know how um, to deal with it. And you you see this as you know, in particular in this region, and particularly in the southeast. But when we have an approaching storm, you'll see um, the the linemen and the trucks. Um, staged uh, outside the storm area because they know that coming in, they're going to have to come in, they're going to have to get debris removed, and they're going to have to get the transmission and the distribution, most most often the distribution lines back up. So that's a hazard that we've um, we've gotten used to. But increasingly, we're seeing severe storms. We're also worried about, um, believe it or not, something called space weather, uh, and you have sun uh, sun flares that can disrupt. Uh, not only the um, uh, electric sector, but the telecommunications sector. Uh, we had a storm here a few weeks ago um, that did cause um, some havoc, uh, but solar weather is, is, is uh, a concern. We're worried about electric magnetic pulses. Um, again, a range of threats and hazards um, that can impact uh, the system itself. Um, on the cyber side, uh, and again, we're going to hear uh, more about this from um, the next speaker, but I would say that overall, um, the likelihood that, you know, the next cyber Pearl Harbor is a day away is not the case. Uh, and I'll say that for a couple of different reasons. One is that, again, the electric um, industry is incredibly um, resilient. Uh, and at the end of the day, they learn uh, and they adapt. But equally important, both the way the system works, and I think you've heard about that this morning, um, but also the recognition that while they are increasingly dependent on industrial control systems, at the end of the day, they're still an operator sitting in an operation center that can go turn, um, that can go flick a switch, that can go turn a crank, uh, and that can mitigate the impact of some sort of cyber intrusion. Uh, it is certainly something that as we think strategically um, about where uh, we're going and as we work to modernize our nation's infrastructure and we become more dependent on the digital infrastructure, it's something that we work with owners and operators across the board to think about, that you still need that human um, uh, uh, interface and that, that ability to go and mitigate um, a potential cyber disruption, that that, that back uh, that back channel, that back uh, fail safe isn't important from a human um, asset. But at the end of the day, and as much as we're seeing on the industrial control system um, front and the, and the number of different malwares and intrusions um, that can impact uh, the operations, again, there's still a human at the end of the day that can go uh, and mitigate that potential threat. We don't have that um, that type of fail safe when it comes to physical damage. Uh, and it is why we are increasingly concerned about um, our adversaries doing damages, um, are damaging um, substations and transformers and or a space weather or an EMP event where you would see multiple transformers uh, damage. This is the biggest challenge that we have at, at the end of the day. These are the component parts of the electric system that are um, take a long time to manufacture. Many of them are not manufactured here in the United States. In fact, most of them. Uh, they're manufactured overseas um, and in China and some of um, our other foreign partners that we've got, um, you know, tenuous relationships with at times. And so both getting, um, ensuring that there is an adequate supply of these transformers, but equally important, if there were to be major um, disruptions to transformers across the United States, how you actually physically move them is what the biggest challenge is. Um, and uh, they are large. Um, they often, uh, they, they, are, they require being moved uh, on rail, and there's a lot of kind of interstate regulations that make it difficult to move these things um, easily. So we are working 
very closely with the electric sector and with the transportation sector, um, again, to um, address this uh, potential threat. Um, what is encouraging to me is, again, I find that the electric industry is very um, forward thinking uh, and very resilient. They understand um, the dependency on these transformers and the impact that um, damage to multiple transformers can have. And so they have developed a, a transformer sharing program depending on the class of transformers that at least we know that there is a, a sufficient number of backup transformers that if there were multiple incidents, we, you know, they are here on American soil. The, the, the challenge is, again, is how do you move them across interstate lines? And so um, we are working to, to mitigate that potential uh, impact. What is interesting um, about some of the recent events that we've seen, and, and uh, some of you may be aware of this, but there was a, uh, an incident in California two years ago uh, this month uh, outside of San Jose at a, a PG&E substation called Metcalf. Um, uh, and ironically, this was in the hours following uh, the events at the Boston Marathon, uh, and it was, it went, um, it kind of flew under, the, the incident flew under the radar for a bit, uh, in part because um, of the nature um, of the attack, and obviously there was a lot going on in those 24 hours following the Boston Marathon, but you had an adversary who lifted the manhole cover. Um, and went underground in this uh, subterranean and, and cut the fiber lines um, that connected this substation both to the downstream um, PG&E substations, um, but also cut the fiber line that controlled the 911 um, system, which meant that all 911 service in the San Jose in the San Jose area um, was was disrupted. Uh, the adversary uh, then proceeded, and, and they knew what they were doing, by the way, that where they cut the fiber lines was up against the wall uh, and made it difficult um, uh, to do a quick repair. Uh, they then proceeded to fire 120 rounds of an AK-47 into the radiators um, of this particular uh, substation, draining the oil, and what they were intending to do was to cause um, the substation to fail and, and really to, you know, make San Jose and the Silicon Valley area um, dark. Um, but because there were some redundant uh, capabilities in place, PG&E was able to um, rebalance uh, the load. It was also night. Uh, it, the weather <clears throat> was cool enough that there was not a, a, a large load at the time. Um, and there weren't a lot of customers using power because it was night. And so PG&E was able to rebalance um, the load and there was no disruption to the San Jose area. But this adversary knew what they were doing. One, in that they cut um, the, the downstream, the SCADA, the, the, the line that connected the, SCADA, the SCADA systems that would have, in theory, prevented PG&E from be, rebalancing the load. But it also made it difficult for local law enforcement um, to communicate uh, with PG&E. Uh, and so we have since gone around the country to raise awareness again of, of our adversaries recognizing that they can both perpetrate a cyber attack and a physical attack and potentially um, cause significant damage. But this leads to my, my final point, which is the interconnected nature of how, uh, of how we work. And that is a lot of what we spend our time doing, is helping owners and operators understand that as much as they need to think about securing um, their own assets and their own systems and ensuring they are resilient to a range of threats and hazards, that they are also dependent uh, on other functions. They're dependent on telecommunications. They're dependent on water. The electric industry is dependent on downstream natural gas. Uh, and as they think about security and resilience, that plan um, has to include uh, the continuity of these other critical functions. And so to use an example, as we went out around the country raising uh, awareness about what happened at Metcalf, it was as much about having the utility owners and operators, or the electric utility owners and operators in the room, as it was about having the telecommunications provider and having the state and local law enforcement. So as they start to see anomalies and incidents, that they are communicating with each other. So that PG&E operations center the next time knows that in addition to, and they had um, some intrusion systems on their fences that at the end of the day, could have pointed to the fact that something was happening. They accounted for the high winds at the time. But had they known that there had been a 911 
uh, line uh, cut and had the sheriff's department been able to contact them because they had also gotten a call about shots fired in the area, they may have approached that particular incident a little bit differently and actually sent folks out to see what was going on. Um, I will end with um, just a, a note about how we work with owners and operators. So in addition to working directly with chief security officers and chief information security officers to talk to them about the threats, we have a range of tools and assessments that we do. We push threat information out to them. We do training around everything from cyber threats to improvised explosive devices to um, space uh, whether we try and exercise where we bring, again, owners and operators together, we, you know, um, have a scenario and talk about how folks would uh, respond uh, to and also prepare for these types of events. But we are increasingly finding that engaging um, the senior executives um, of these companies, of trade associations, uh, is really important. These are the folks who are managing brand risk, operational risk, regulatory risk, uh, and I would posit that they need to have security and resilience uh, on their radar too, because a disruption caused by a security event can have an impact uh, on operations, can certainly impact the brand. Look at what happened with Target. Uh, and and the, the cyber intrusion that happened um, there. Uh, and it causes all sorts of regulatory levers to be um, uh, initiated as well. And so we have been working very closely, especially in this sector, with the CEOs of the investor owns, the rural um, firms and, and the um, public power companies. Um, we brought them to the table. We've given them a, a kind of much deeper dive of, of the um, environment that I've given you. Um, and now on a quarterly basis, meet with them. Um, we've got a work plan in terms of the things that we're trying to address. Uh, we're working on a plan for how we would handle um, something like what happened in Japan where you had an earthquake, a tsunami, uh, and then the event at Fukushima. Uh, what are the roles and responsibilities of industry? What are the roles and responsibilities of government? Where do we know we have some challenges? Let's go back to the transformer issue and how we would uh, move those transformers and how can we ensure that we're working uh, in coordinated action. But increasingly, these CEOs also recognize the importance that they need to be working with and meeting with their counterparts in the financial services area, in the water sector, in the transportation sector, in the downstream natural gas and in the communication sector. Because again, without those key functions, it would be hard for uh, the electric sector to do uh, what it is doing. So. Um, to end, uh, it is a very complex and dynamic uh, environment. Um, as you learned earlier, uh, um, the, the electric industry works very closely with its public utility commissions to, um, as they make investments in upgrading the electric infrastructure and putting in security and resilience measures, they actually have to go to the utility commissions to get to do rate recovery. They can't pass those costs on to customers without getting approval from the public utility commissions. And so in a day and age when they're looking at everything from vandalism to cyber threats to how are you resilient to space weather and EMP, it's asking a lot in terms of what are all the things that you put in place to mitigate them. So part of what we do is help them understand what are the protective measures that uh, can mitigate a number of these different threats, but also working with them to help make the case to the public utility commissions about why they should be able to you know, do rate recovery for these particular investments. I find it, and I will end with this again, that, that it is a, a very resilient sector um, they are um, very cognizant about the range of things that can impact them to include cybersecurity. Uh, and um, they are, uh, again, working to ensure uh, that they can remain uh, resilient through a range of different threats and hazards. So with that, I will turn it to Joe. And uh, then we'll take questions afterwards. Oh, one thing, if you have not um, read this or seen this, this is the ePro handbook. This is a great primer just into the range of threats and hazards faced by the electric uh, industry, how it works, how they're dealing with it. It's an easy read. Uh, and in fact, I, I've got folks all over the country. I have given a copy um, to all of my folks uh, out uh, in the field so they can get a better sense of how uh, the uh, electric sector works.
Jim, did those pictures make it or or no? Would they? Uh, yeah, they should be in there. Okay. All right. Fantastic. So I'm going to keep this simple. This is we started this morning uh, with a great overview of how complicated this machine is, mm -hmm. and it's ex an extraordinarily complicated machine. I'm convinced that the electric system, at least in North America, is probably the most complicated man-made machine in existence. And the fact that it works in real time every day is a testament to how great our electrical engineers are in this country. I mean, that we have a product that is produced the instant that it's consumed, and we don't know where it's coming from or where it's going, but it all works. So I'm going to ask the engineers to, uh, to forgive me as I oversimplify the system, because uh, I know it's against their nature, but they're going to want to correct every, every imperfection in my talk, so please. Uh, but here we, we've got an example of these things are massive, and this is just one generator. Right? In a typical generating station like this, we have dozens of subsystems from fuel handling, water purification, turbine monitoring, emissions monitoring that are all controlled uh, by industrial control systems, which is a fancy way of saying computers. So they are all have a cyber threat element. So we're controlling them in real time with computers. We no longer staff to control these things manually. We no longer have the skilled personnel to operate the electric sector like we did 50 years ago. It's, we depend on automation or it wouldn't work. Here's another example of a, of a generating station. And we remember, we've learned today, these are typically large. I mean, it's changing a little bit, but still today, we typically have large generators that are geographically isolated. Uh, we talked about the siting challenges we have with transmission lines. Well, believe me, no one wants one of these in their backyard either. These are tremendously difficult uh, facilities to build, to engineer, and to site. And for those of you that have, I, I see some colleagues that I've worked with over the years who have gone through this process of, of getting, the poss getting the permitting, uh, getting the uh, rate cases approved so that you can get recovery from your constituents and your customers in terms of paying for these assets, and that they have a lifespan of 30 to 40 to 50 years. I mean, when we look at the electric infrastructure in North America today, we've got a huge percentage of it that's more than years old. So that's one of our challenges from a cybersecurity perspective. So additional background, we've got to get it from where it's made to where it's going. So this is a substation. Again, massive facilities, and there are thousands of substations in the United States and in North America. Again, all of this, there's a control room, some, you can't see it in this picture, but there's a control room that's again full of computers. And all of this information that's coming back to these operators in real time, we call it telemetry, and it works over SCADA systems. All of this is coming over computers, computer networks, older uh, protocols, telephone networks, etc. back to an operator to make informed decisions. So all of that, we had a talk earlier this morning where they mentioned situation, oops, situational awareness. And that situational awareness is all of that data coming back to an operator so they can make informed decisions. So one of the things that I want you to think about in terms of the cyber threat is what if the information the operator is given is incorrect? What if, the, what if it's the exact opposite of what's really happening in the field? What if this breaker is open but the operator's console shows it is closed. I mean, there are very, very severe consequences in that this equipment that is extraordinarily expensive, difficult to procure, and difficult to manufacture and install, long lead times can be damaged and loss of life. I mean, when, when we have technicians working on this equipment, we expect the, uh, the state of the equipment to be safe. And that's made, that decision is helped by the situational awareness and by the operator. So we've got another transmission substation. J this just shows the scale of these facilities. It's, it's just remarkable. If you've ever get an opportunity to tour one, or if you 
do so. I mean, they are fantastically immense, and the fact that they work is amazing. So how do we pull it all together? Well, this is, a, this is an older picture of a control center. Uh, this is probably a, a mid-90s uh, vintage, maybe early 2000 uh, vintage control center. That is a, a map board that is uh, uh, digitized. So it's, it, they used to have them with push pins and magnets even. But all of this information uh, show, is showing the system operators who would typically sit down here in real time what, what, this, what the transmission system is doing. So these are probably substations and generators, and then you've got transmission lines in between, and the color coding tells the operators how, how much uh, electricity is going across each line, uh, what actions they need to be, and this is where they make those decisions that the load, the, the customer usage, is now balanced with what is coming out of my generators. And at every phase, of this operation, we have an opportunity for cyber events to take advantage of it. And that's what we're trying to protect. And we're challenged by this aging infrastructure, uh, the aging workforce. We don't have human operators every place anymore. Uh, we certainly have them in our control centers. I mean, that's, but we do not have operators in a typical substation anymore. Uh, we, how many people have a meter man that comes to their home to read their meter? Uh, you know, th those folks are no longer, I mean, our, all of our meters are, are, almost all of our meters are read in an automated fashion. And we have old protocols, protocols that were designed decades ago where these new cyber threats were not envisioned. It's not that the people that designed this equipment were stupid. Uh, they just had, it had not occurred to them that someone would maliciously want to take this over and cause the equipment to misoperate. It was not even in the realm of possibility in their thinking at that time. So these protocols were not necessarily designed with security features. Uh, the equipment gets a message and it executes it. So we have a lot of security questions that need to go into that. Like, how do I know that the message that, that is, is coming from a legitimate system operator and that the action that I'm going to take will not be destructive? And we have newer protocols now that can allow us uh, to authenticate those messages, encrypt the messages, et cetera, so that we can help mitigate some of those cyber threats but we're in the same risk management problem that everyone else is, right? Uh, upgrading the equipment is capital intensive. It costs money. Uh, it costs people need to go install it and maintain it. And we have to balance these risks along with all of the other risks that affect the grid. But I will say the threat actors are extraordinarily sophisticated. And I've worked um, in the utility industry for, for many years and have had the opportunity to work in a security operations center where we're monitoring security events across our system, uh, both physical you know, alarms and, and uh, cybersecurity events. And I've worked with a number of utilities that, <clears throat> that have similar facilities. And the number of events that we see is the, the challenge is not getting the events, it's filtering out all of them and, and getting to the one in 100,000 that's actionable. Because when we look at our systems, we find out that they're being probed constantly. And in fact, the number of events that we see resulting from probes is the capacity of our equipment to log and get them to us. So, you know, 50 to 100 events per second uh, on a traditional medium-sized utility that are monitoring their assets. So, I mean, it's just looking constantly for an opening so that I can exploit that system. And, and we, there are just fantastic statistics. You know, if you put an unpatched system on, on the Internet, which you would never do with a control system, by the way. Uh, unfortunately, there are people who have. Uh, there's a search engine out there called Shodan, which will find them for you. Uh, I certainly hope they're not our customers. I uh, know it certainly would not be our recommended installation. Uh, but check. 
those systems have a, a lifespan of seconds before they're taken over by an adversary. So we have to be diligent. We have to engineer our systems uh, to pr protect the auth authenticity of those control messages. Uh, but it's extraordinarily challenging. Uh, I, will, I will leave it with that. It's a complex machine. Uh, we are, are faced with the aging infrastructure, a uh, reduction in the skills needed to maintain it, and the sophistication of our threat actors is, continues to increase. So we are approaching it in a systematic method. Uh, the electric sector, uh, ISAC, and, and NERC do a fantastic job. Uh, the financial sector does an excellent job as well. And, and <clears throat> the electric sector, sector has been working together for a very long time to address these issues. And, and we're doing so in a, in a balanced way and modernizing the, the equipment, allowing the equipment to use the newer protocols that will authenticate the messages, encrypt it to keep adversaries out, and act in real time to uh, route around issues or problems of any kind uh, will help improve the overall resiliency of the grid. So with that, I'll open it up for questions for, for Caitlin or myself. Thank you very much, Jim. We, uh, we'd be delighted to take a couple of questions, um, if there are some. Uh, and we are, of course, over time already. Yes, sir. Absolutely, uh, we're concerned about that as a threat, and uh, particularly in these smart grid distribution management systems, uh, remote disconnect is the is the threat that we're most concerned about. Uh, we're most concerned about someone being able to get upstream into a control center environment, and with the push of a button, uh, disconnect hundreds of megawatts of load immediately and cause. Uh, imbalances in the system that could cascade and cause widespread outages. Not that hundreds of megawatts wouldn't be a widespread outage, but we're talking now across the, the greater part of one of those interconnects. So the, the systems have been engineered to prevent that. So while it is certainly theoretically possible uh, that you have uh, from a meter connectivity back to a control center, there are numerous safeguards in place to prevent that from happening. All the way to the operator control and having uh, you know, more than one person <coughs> pushing the button before we do remote disconnect, remote, you know, uh, controlling the numbers of meters that can be disconnected at a single time, those types of things. That's a, that's a great question. Well, we're going to end with that great question, and I'm going to ask uh, Caitlin and Joe's indulgence and and uh, uh, say thank you very, very much for your presentations. Uh, and uh, uh, we obviously need to have a much longer conversation about this, but thank you. We have one very brief panel and one long panel, and... Um, I'm going to ask uh, uh, Messrs. Fine and, and Monroe to come up. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, the clean power plan that EPA has proposed and what its implications are for transmission. And you'll have to forgive us, forgive me in particular, for not allowing enough time to really explore this in detail. Um, but again, we're going to be hearing a lot more about this as EPA finalizes its rule this summer. So, um, let me at least remember what it is, who it is we're talking to. Uh, Steve Fine is, is Vice President of ICF International. 
uh, the Energy Advisory and Solutions Practice. Um, he's been around the business a long time, and, and uh, I'm, uh, I, I've seen some of ICF's work in this area already. It's really quite impressive and, and, uh, and helps convey, uh, you know, kind of tangible, tangible evidence of what the implications of this change in the generation mix that EPA is proposing uh, augurs for the, for the future. Carl Monroe, of course, uh, is uh, Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer of SPP, uh, somebody who's known very well, certainly to our membership. Carl and SPP are members of, of WIRES, and, uh, as is ICF, actually. But um, uh, Carl, um, uh, Carl is uh, going to explore uh, a little bit about um, uh, how an RTO would look at this issue and the kinds of dilemmas uh, that you're facing in terms of, of planning for the uncertainties involved in, in the clean power plan. So uh, I'm going to ask you to try and keep it brief so we don't run out of time. Unfortunately, they're going to they're gonna send in a general that looks sort of like that to run us out of here at 3 o'clock. So uh, I, I want to make sure we have enough time for our last group. So I'll turn it over to you. Can we just tee up the slides? I think you're... There we go. Okay. All right. Well, good afternoon. Uh, pleasure to be here. Thank you, Jim, for the invitation. Um, as Jim mentioned, ICF is uh, we're an energy and environmental consulting firm. We've been doing this kind of work for a long time, um, and are in addition to that a member of the the Wires uh, consortium. So I've been asked to be brief. I will definitely try to do that. Um, I'm going to talk about the Clean Power Plan 111D new source performance standards comes under sort of a, a bunch of different names. As, as it's the talk, if you're in this part of the, in the environmental regulatory part and looking at what environmental regulations are on the, on the power sector, and we've been looking at these for a long time, uh, it's clear that once you look at this, that this is just not another air regulation, right? This is essentially is in many ways rewrites the resource plan uh, of the U.S. Um, and, and really rearranges the U.S. power map. Uh, the reduction requirements vary significantly, uh, and, and this came ab about as a result of not getting federal legislation to, uh, to control greenhouse gas emissions. So what we have is EPA regulating greenhouse gas emissions under the Clean uh, Air Act, and everybody said, don't do it, don't do it. You really you need to go down the, you should go down the federal legislative route because if you do it through the Clean Air Act, which isn't really meant to regulate uh, greenhouse gases, then it's going to be a mess. Well, here we are. Um, but what EPA has done is given tremendous flexibility to the states. I'll talk about this all a little bit more briefly. But so state policy design really matters, but we don't know what that looks like at all just yet. Um, the, the, it will result in significant retirements uh, uh, in the system. Coal retirements, it's what it's meant to do is to drive down coal generation increase gas generation, increase renewable generation, and increase the use of energy efficiency. So it really is going to sort of rewrite the resource map. Uh, and how the, all those things come into balance depends on the standards that EPA sets. And we're yet to see a final rule that's coming this summer. Uh, and it depends on the programmatic way in which each individual state will implement those standards, will implement obtaining the program to obtain those standards, to attain those standards. Um, and it's clear that given how it's going to rearrange the resource map, the transmission has a tremendously large role to play in all this. So that's the setup. A couple of sort of basics about the Clean Power Plan. Um, it was proposed last June. EPA, is, they received comments, over 2 million comments received on new source performance standards. And what I'm talking about right now is 111D as opposed to 111B. 111D, even though it says it's called New Source Performance Standards, regulates existing sources, um, the cutoff being January 8th, 2014. So if you were under construction or in operation as of January 8th, 2014, you are regulated under 111D. If you are a new unit, including new gas units, um, that are being constructed currently or any time after January 8th, 2014, mm -hmm. you fall under 111B which for a gas unit is not difficult to meet. Uh, it essentially rules out coal without carbon capture sequestration. 
Um, many have argued that you're not going to build a lot of new coal anyway, given the economics and low natural gas prices, and, and there's something to that. Um, but EPA based it on four building blocks. You often hear of block one, blocks one, two, and three, one, two, three, and four. Uh, there's a, there will be a lot of legal arguments. EPA will be sued over this rule when it comes out. Um, a lot about whether there was regulatory overreach. There, I'm not going to go into all the details right now. But safe to say that blocks two through four will be the ones that are going to be legally challenged. Um, and for transmission and resource planning purposes, it's really blocks two and three that matter. Block two is the redispatch of coal to natural gas, and block three is there's some preserve there's some nuclear in there, uh, but it's really about building new renewables and, and the amount of new re new renewables that will come on the system. Uh, so I'll, I'll there, so lots to be discussed about the building blocks, but um, in the interest of time, I'm going to keep moving. Uh, I'm going to show you some maps that are based on EPA analysis, these bubble charts, <laughs> this third diagram down, I'll go into that in a little more detail, that show where EPA, in their own analysis, when they, that they came out with the proposal rule back in June, is expecting to see additional coal retirements, where they're expecting to see additional renewables, what the shift in generation overall is going to look like. And, and the purpose of that is just to emphasize the fact that you can agree or disagree with the specific analyses that EPA has done, but the fact of the matter is, again, that the map is going to move, and resources as we've known them uh, are going to change, and, and how they have, how those resources access load and how they balance the system um, is going to matter and, and is yet to be completely figured out. Um, and then, of course, the final rule will be coming out this summer, as we said, um, and then states are the ones to implement the programs they have between one and three years to actually write what is the equivalent of their state implementation plans. They're not quite called that, but they're effectively the state implementation plans, where they're going to be uh, coming up with the programmatic uh, ways in which they are going to, to meet those rules. So you're going to see a parallel process going on here. On the one hand, there's going to be a lot of smoke uh, and um, uh, around the legal issues, and a lot of, I, I would suggest, and, and you'll see a lot of, uh, there'll be a lot of discussion in Congress, and there'll be a lot of discussion in the courts as to where this rule is going to go. And at the same time, states are going to have to start moving down that, the pathway of putting programs in place. Uh, so short of a full-on stay by the D.C. District Court, uh, the states are just going to have to keep moving. So this is just a, a chart that goes across the 47 states in, in the lower U.S. Uh, Vermont is the only state that doesn't have fossil generation. But what it does is show the starting rates, the fossil rates in 2012, which is what EPA based this all on. And you can see the states on the left-hand chart side of the chart are sort of all those above 2,000 pounds. This is pounds per megawatt hour CO2 emissions. Those on the, the left side of the chart are um, those that are sort of all coal all the time in their fossil mix. Those on the right-hand side of the chart that are under 1,000 pounds a megawatt hour are all basically natural gas. Uh, <laughs> all the time with no coal, and those states in the middle are some blend between the two. And this, again, is just fossil rate, not blending in renewables and nuclear or other non-emitting sources. Um, and then the decrement, so the, the 2012 is the starting point, the height of the total bar, and then those color bars represent the four building blocks that EPA used to get them down to the final rate, right, which is called the best system of emissions reductions. And those rates, again, these are what were in the proposed rule. EPA is rejiggering some things, recalculating some things right now in response to the many comments that it received, over 2 million, as I mentioned, on 111B by itself. Um, and, and they're going to be coming out with those final rates uh, come uh, this summer. And, and those rates matter because they essentially they differentiate between the states. So some states have higher compliance targets, some states have lower compliance targets, and that sort of alters the playing field right there, uh, certainly the traditional playing field. It's already altered from the get-go, uh, but this alters it considerably more, with some states having a larger obligation, some states having a smaller obligation. Uh, I'm, I'm going quickly. so. Uh, so this is the first in a series of uh, maps I just wanted to show. EPA, by their own analysis, is showing that coal retirements in the U.S. is basically going to double by 2020. And that is relative to the base case that they analyzed that included the mercury and air toxic standards, so the MAT standards, which already 
took out roughly uh, 50 gigawatts. That and low natural gas prices uh, certainly have hurt coal economics. But that is responsible for roughly 50 gigawatts of coal retirements. Add on the clean power plan as analyzed by EPA, and you see another, an additional 50 gigawatts of coal retirements. And so if you, just to put it in context, we started um, before the match regulations, whoops, uh, with roughly the coal fleet of nationwide of roughly 300 gigawatts. So, and by the time we get to 2020 with the clean power plan, we're going to basically weed out 100 gigawatts, right? So a third of the coal fleet, rough numbers, um, is going to be gone by 2020. So that's just a, a reorientation. It's not to say many of those plants were older. Many of them were relatively inefficient. Many of them were not controlled, hence they didn't make it past the MATS bar, which controls for mercury and air toxics. Um, so there are multiple reasons, but the fact of the matter is that the, gen the traditional generation mix in this country and that's 300 gigawatts of coal out of roughly 1,000 gigawatts. We're a little bit higher than that now uh, total. But you take that, and we're, we're wiping out basically a third of the coal fleet. So just it's going to rearrange the map. Again, at the same time, you're going to have an almost doubling of renewables. And this is where you've got wind. Um, this is just referring to wind. You have some other renewable solar PV, in particular solar, and some solar thermal coming in, uh, looking at EPA's analysis. But this just shows you that the green dots are where you're going to see increased amount of wind builds, um, whereas the, the, the white bubbles are where you're going to see decreased amounts of wind build. And it's sort of in the decreases are in the Midwest. It has to do with a certain way that EPA has sort of set up the interstate transfer of renewable credits versus how RPS has actually worked today. I'm not going to, again, go into details. But the fact of the matter is that to access these renewables, there's going to need to be, and we heard that this uh, we heard that this morning, that there's going to need to be transmission, right? Because getting accessing good renewable resources and bringing that into the load centers is going to require some transmission. Um, and then, lastly, just looking at uh, generation across the board, and this is just gigawatt hours, so all generation, all resources that are putting power onto the grid. Some regions are net positive. Some regions are net negative. Again, this is not arguing good or bad. This is arguing that there's factually going to be a big shift in the generation mix of the country, and uh, the transmission system is going to have to uh, adapt to that. Now, when you look at um, power system reliability, and there's been a lot of discussion about reliability and, and how FERC should weigh in and how NERC should weigh in around the clean power plan, um, and how the, the individual RTOs should, be, uh, should weigh in on these, and we'll hear about that in a minute. There are a few things to look at when you look at power system reliability. The first is resource adequacy, and that is, do you just maintain reserve margins, right? Reserve margins are because electricity is, is a real-time product without the advent of significant storage, which is just starting to sort of make its way into the market. Um, you need to balance that system on a real-time basis. Because of that, you need to hold a reserve in place. Typically, that reserve is 15 percent. It varies a little bit, but that, that's not a bad sort of back-of-the-envelope number. Um, and so when EPA looked at this and looked at the clean power plan, they looked at it in terms of resource adequacy. And indeed, given the changes in the mix, so you're retiring coal in one place, you're building gas in another place, you're building renewables in another place, you've got some energy efficiency going on. So on balance, they looked at the resource adequacy issue and they deemed that it was sufficient, that there is, and indeed, the lights stay on in their analysis. Um, what they didn't look at and what they say they're not charged to look at, which is true, are the transmission security and the transmission adequacy issues. And so uh, I'm sort of teeing it up for <laughs> Carl um, because that's really the role of the RTOs, right, to look at that. And, and, and I won't steal any, any of Carl's thunder, um, but he can tell you about SPP and how they're looking at, at, at this issue. So, but just keep in mind there are multiple aspects to power system reliability. Resource adequacy is, is certainly important, but not the only component. Uh, and again, just another uh, segue into Carl's piece, various system operators, including ERCOT, SPP, WEC, PJM, and, and others, uh, MISO, ha have sort of weighed in and uh, ha have looked at this and have come out with their own regional reports. NERC is going to be coming out with a report. Uh, and, and so there are, a lot of, there, there are a lot of folks that are very concerned, particularly with not so much the 2030 date, which is where EPA goes with those final targets that I showed you, that bar chart, um, but with the interim targets, with the 2020 target. 
uh, and there's a lot of concern about how, given enough time, there's no doubt that the system can adapt. It's a question of timing and whether you can get, we've all heard about the lead times associated with new uh, transmission projects, but can the system adapt quickly enough? So, last slide, very quick. Um, just to, to recap, transmission is going to be part of the compliance for the Clean Power Plan. Um, the states, as we said, are going to play a key role, and those state programs are going to start to be developed once the final rule is issued this coming, sun, this coming uh, summer. Um, lots of uncertainty around the impacts. We'll know more once we see the final rule, and especially the thing to look for are those interim targets and what happens in, in that 2020 time frame. <laughs> The 2030 is less, again, because of the time to adapt, is less of concern. Um, and transmission is an integral piece to all of that. So with that flyby, I'll uh, turn it over to Carl. Thank you. Well, thanks for inviting me. I am going to talk about some of the things that actually have been talked about this morning. Uh, but also Steve has done a great job of introducing the subject of transmission and what reliability means for MIT. And as you can see up there, that's our mission statement, helping our members work together to keep the lights on today and in the future. So you can see that our main mission is reliability itself. Uh, this is actually a chart that shows both the capacity that we have to create electricity and the consumption on a particular uh, year itself. This was in 2013 itself, and you can see that, at least from SBP's perspective, we're pretty much mixed between gas and, and coal itself, although as coal is actually cheaper to produce electricity, uh, we use a lot more of the coal. But you can see that we have renewables that are starting to get in there, both the We've had uh, traditional hydro, but then the wind itself is uh, at least producing in 2013 was about 11 percent. In 2014, it was about 13 percent. We've had days where 36 percent of the energy or an hour where 36 percent of the energy uh, from SPP was produced by wind itself. Uh, <clears throat> and we've been constructing transmission. These are transmission projects that have been constructed uh, over a nine year period itself. Uh, a lot of that uh, construction has taken place in the last three or four years. That's about a third of what we intend to build with uh, over the next uh, uh, six to eight years, too. So we have a lot of transmission projects that are already in uh, process, and that transmission was being built both to deliver some of these renewables and to actually uh, provide reliability for that and provide reliable service to our members, but also uh, to get the economic benefits of using this mix of generation that we have in, in and of itself. This gives you a chart, and this was probably one that was mentioned before that people have seen before, is this is a chart of actually the average wind speeds, um, annual wind speeds, and then you can see where the SPP footprint is. And this includes uh, some members that are joining as of October 1st of this year in North and South Dakota, and you can see that it's a pretty significant wind uh, development area in SPP. And you can see that it is on the west side, for the most part it's on the west side of SPP and on the east side is where all the load is, even within SPP. Uh, another interesting thing is from the Panhandle of Texas to San Francisco is actually closer than to go from the Panhandle of Texas to Chicago. So in that sense, you know, we're kind of sitting in the middle of the country with all these natural resources, both this and, as you can see, uh, with solar uh, provision, too. So there's a lot of potential there uh, to be used uh, in the CPP to, to respond to the, the intents of that. Uh, this is just the same thing Steve showed, but this shows the, the ones for the SPP region itself. A significant number of our states have a lot of work to do to comply. Uh, this is the, the waterfall chart. This is what Steve was also talking about, about the interim goals and the final goal. You can see that for the most part we have to eat, meet the, the interim goals. is significantly the final goals anyway. Um, and as you can see, that's in 2020, and here we are in 2015. The rule comes out in summer. They got a year to put the, the states have a year to put the plan together, maybe two years, maybe three years. Uh, and so you only have two, three years to respond to that. And, and in some regards, building new gas plants may even be restrictive in that point. You may be able to build more renewables in that time frame, but at the same time, we've got to talk about transmission, too. Uh, <clears throat> so we did, a, we did an analysis uh, actually back last year uh, to look at the reliability impacts of the clean power plan. Uh, and we did that on two things, and Steve's already introduced both of those, resource adequacy, 
uh, or reserve margins is what we call it, or transmission impacts themselves. Uh, so what we did was we just took the, the expected retirements that Steve's already talked about in the uh, uh, rule uh, and uh, retired those generators uh, and saw what the problems were just in retiring that generation itself. Uh, and we saw that from the, both a transmission impact and from a uh, capacity margin or reserve margin impact itself. Uh, but then we also said, well, what would be a natural way to respond to the capacity issue with additional generation? What would that cause on the transmission system? So those are the two parts. And the best way to say that is what happens if we comply by just retiring the generators and we don't build any new in infrastructure or what happens if we retire all the generators that are expected and add new generation, but we still can't build the transmission in the time frame. And in both those cases, we have to, we'd have to make a choice between violating a NERC standard, one law, uh, in order to meet the other law or the other regulation, if you want to look at it that way. So we're in a quandary here on 2020 of which law to, or which regulation do we actually violate. Uh, this is all those retirements that Steve showed, but this shows the specific, particular ones, at least in SPP. And then this was when we did the part two, this is where we added generation and the types of generation. And you can look at this when you get it uh, to see where we would have expected to add generation. Again, this was based on just the best guess we had about where we would add generation. It's not up to us to add generation. It's up to the members to add the generation. And here's where all the violations occurred uh, from a reliability assessment of the transmission system. And this is a reserve margin. You can see we have a minimum of 13.6 as reserve margin, uh, but by 2020 it'd be only 4.7, which we'd not be meeting that requirement, and that would put load at risk of being able to serve it. Uh, this uh, gives you an idea of what it takes us to build transmission, and that's from the time that we start to study for what we need to transmission. It takes us anywhere from 12 to 18 months to, to get the study done because you want to make sure you're making a wise decision. It's a 40-year asset. You're talking billions of dollars here. Uh, you want to make a wise decision in doing that. And then you actually have to now, under Order 1000, you have to go out and actually bid this stuff out. So that means you spend another year uh, bidding the projects out to get them built in and of itself. And then it takes anywhere from two to six years to actually construct it. So you're talking somewhere between eight and a half to, to 10 years to get transmission built uh, from the time that you envision just starting the study itself. And that's a, the long lead time. That's a long pole in the tent now for, uh, for planning uh, is transmission itself. And that's why it's important that we understand what the impacts are going to be and have the time to do it uh, so that we can build the correct transmission infrastructure to actually make this work. Uh, <clears throat> so anyway, this just sums up what we talked about. What we actually asked the EPA in there is that we needed more time. We needed more time to meet the interim goals. There's, it's, it's almost impossible to meet the, uh, the interim goals without putting the, the load and the transmission system significantly at rest, risk. Uh, but if we have the time, we should be able to, to meet those requirements, uh, particularly given enough time so that parties can make wise decisions, not only the states and how they're going to do the implementation plan, but the parties who have to respond with their generation and plans itself and then the transmission that actually lags all of that. At the same time, we ask for a reliability safety valve so that if you know, we're going to cause a reliability problem. Give us, you know, don't give us this, this choice of violating one rule or the other. Give us the choice of making sure that we protect reliability of the transmission system. We also uh, started another study uh, the end of last year and just completed it. It's out uh, on um, our website if you want to go look at it. But this, the members came and asked us to also look at what the, how we could actually comply um, with this, you know, using those building blocks, at least what was uh, reasonably to expect that you could do in each of the building blocks, how could we comply, and what it would cost. And they not only want to look at it that way as uh, what would it take SPP, but we want to look at it on a regional basis and a state-by-state -state basis to see if there's a difference between uh, trying to have the states work together to come up with a regional solution uh, and see whether that makes a difference in cost. Uh, we just completed the regional part of that. We've just started the state by state. Uh, everyone else that's done this before has found that a state by state is more expensive than a regional. We expect probably that'll be the same case here. 
uh, because you don't get that overall efficiency of the use of the, the planning and the, gen and the actual operation of the system on a regional basis. That's one reason that we are here because, or SPP is here, because we get more efficient, efficient operation and planning out of a region than we do out of trying to do it state by state. Uh, so, but anyway, it, it will take significant amount, even within uh, the regional, which is the one that we've published, it'll take significant amount of changes uh, in the generation mix, which then says there's going to be a significant amount of uh, gen uh, changes in the transmission system itself. Uh, <clears throat> so that's kind of where we're at with SPP. Again, we're waiting, as Steve has talked about, we're waiting for the final rule to see if there's been adjustments in the, hopefully, in the interim goal. Hopefully, they'll give us a... a a uh, reliability safety valve. Hopefully, they'll make it easier uh, to do a regional approach than it was in the in the draft rule itself. So that's what we're really looking at uh, from SPP's perspective. Again, our mission is to protect uh, the members in their delivery and make it where they can keep their lights on. So I appreciate your interest. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Carl and Steve, and I. Uh, we. Um, when this rule hits the streets in June, something like that, uh, June, whenever, um, we'll probably have another Wires University just to delve more deeply into this uh, and uh, because the, it will raise a whole new set of questions, I'm sure. But thank you very much. We're going to go on to our, to our next and final panel. Um, I'm uh, uh, Delighted to invite up uh, four uh, executives and experts in this area. I'm glad you all stuck with us today because this is uh, the piece de resistance. And um, I looked out the window, and don't worry about it, it's snowing out there, so <laughs> just stay put. Can you get past me? Thank you, Ann. Um, let me let me uh, let me briefly introduce uh, our last panel, and thank you all for coming. I also want to recognize because I didn't do it earlier, uh, the Honorable Mike Ross, a former congressman from Arkansas, uh, and who now works with the Southwest Power Pool, and I'm delighted. Mike, that you're able to be here. This is great support for us. Um, uh, Commissioner Phil Moeller um, joined the uh, FERC, the, the, uh, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Um, uh, it, the, the, first, the first chairman of the, of the FERC hated it being called the FERC. Uh, because he, he was on the Hill at the time the legislation that created FERC was drafted, and it almost got called the Federal Utility Commission, and I, I think he never, he, he never quite got over that, but, but um, uh, we call it FERC, we be, beloved agency of ours, and uh, Phil has been there since 2006. He has been a great friend of transmission, of competitive markets, um, he is in his the end of your second term, I believe, and um, has uh, was previously a uh, energy policy advisor to Senator Slate Gordon from Washington, and uh, has had uh, jobs in the utility sector. Um, uh, I consider Phil be a great friend and a great friend to Wires and. Um, and I hope he uh, uh, has a third term, a fourth term. Um, anyway, uh, thank you, uh, Commissioner, for being here. Um, our next panelist is um, Vice President uh, of Transmission Operations for Pacific Gas and Electric. Uh, Greg Lemler, Lemler excuse me, um, has been in that job for a while now, but he's had almost every other job uh, uh, in the uh, in the uh, uh, in PG&E. Um, uh, had various positions uh, in engineering, planning, uh, maintenance, construction, project management, 
and uh, his uh, his storied career at at PG and E is is not over. And we're we're especially pleased that um, that Greg um, uh, chose to last year to have PG and E join our organization. Uh, his uh, his uh, 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 most recent role was senior director of electric transmission system operations, and uh, you know PG and E system is. 18,000 uh, miles of electric transmission, a lot of it at very high voltages, uh, and 960 transmission and distribution substations. So he really knows whereof he speaks, but uh, the, the interesting thing is that, the, that his company is so involved in the evolving um, uh, Western um, uh, bulk power markets. Uh, and. Uh, he may want to say some things about that. He's a registered engineer. He's uh, an alum of my uh, um, of my school, the University of Wisconsin, and um, and he also has an uh, MBA. Uh, so you know, a lot of engineers with MBAs. I think we we see a, a definite trend here. But uh, our our next uh, a panelist is is Mike Skelly, uh, who's president and founder. Um, uh, of clean line energy. If you follow the development of big uh, electricity pipelines, that is high voltage direct current lines that are interregional in nature and designed to bring renewable energy uh, from parts of the country where we have very high quality uh, wind uh, to other parts of, of the economy, the other parts of the country. Um, that is that is uh, clean lines uh, mission mike mike um, was uh, one of the founders uh, of uh, horizon wind and uh, was there for a long time he has experience in thermal hydroelectric biomass and energy projects uh, but uh, uh, naturally he he would come home to good old transmission so uh, we're we're delighted that he's uh, that he's here. He's a, he's a Notre Dame grad, and he has an MBA too from Harvard Business School. Well, um, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Wade Smith, who I just met today. Uh, Wade is President and Chief Operating Officer of AEP Texas, um, and um, uh, the 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 uh, this represents a, a branching out and uh, of um, of. Um, uh, essentially a Midwestern, big Midwestern utility into, into new markets. Uh, he oversees uh, distribution uh, of electricity for 900,000 uh, customers in Central and North Texas. Um, and uh, as, as uh, in that role, he, he sees all parts of, uh, of the grid. He was uh, uh, formerly uh, Vice President of Transmission Engineering and project services at AEP. Um, he's a mechanical engineer, um, uh, and uh, oh my God, he's got an MBA from uh, <laughs> Abilene Christian University. You know, I'm feeling sort of inadequate, so I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna let this uh, let this go. Um, this is an open discussion, uh, uh, one you can all raise your hands and ask questions, but. Uh, I had the temerity to sort of come up with some with some questions for them to to answer. It all seems a little silly right now because um, they probably want to talk about what they want to talk about. But um, let's let's just put this on the table. Uh, how has the role of the grid changed in recent years, and and uh, do you see new demands on uh, the electric transmission system? that are going to fundamentally change your jobs or change the way we think about um, the high voltage transmission system? And um, I think that would be a, an especially interesting question for a regulator too because, uh, um, well. Mr. Chairman, would you like me to start? <laughs> uh, well, thank you for holding this forum. Thank you for all attending. I'll go just about anywhere to talk about transmission because I've tried to make it the top priority during my 
by uh, terms at the commission because as you've probably heard in themes throughout the day, depending on how deep you are into this issue, it's the ultimate enabler that we have as our fuel mix changes, either because of economics or because of regulations. Transmission allows us to go through that change uh, with uh, flexibility. It's also, of course, essential to the reliability of the grid, something we take for granted, but which uh, thousands of people work very hard to assure uh, a little anecdotally, 1.2 to 1.4 billion people in the world have no electricity. Another 1 billion have intermittent electricity. So reliability uh, is something that they had, uh, would obviously like, something we pretty much have, but it's increasingly important uh, from health and safety and economic perspective as well. Transmission can cut customers' rates when a congestion on the grid, similar to con congestion on freeways, costs people money because power can't flow to where it's demanded without the, the cost of, of a congested grid. So it has a variety of benefits. The technology is changing. Uh, some of the people be, uh, behind those changes are here at the table. It's an exciting time, but it's still, uh, it still has its challenges in terms of us expanding the grid, which, again, based on the panel you just heard, uh, is perhaps going to be increasingly important particularly in terms of building block three under the clean power plan. Thank you. So I, I guess I would add to, to that or perhaps reinforce a couple of the points there. And uh, this is something that FERC has focused a lot on is the facilitation of markets. So over the last uh, decade or two, we have gone from a regulatory construct to where we said, okay, we got an incumbent utility, they have assets, they put them in rate base, everybody pays for them, everybody pays for the transmission, and if, it's a, if the utility makes a great investment, then that works out well for the rate payers, and if the utility makes a dumb investment, that doesn't work out so well for the rate payers. And so uh, we've gone, we're slowly evolving toward uh, a, and it's spotty in different parts of the country, but we rely more and more on markets, and we rely on the markets to uh, allocate capital and to, alloc and to make decisions around um, resources to a large extent. So uh, without a grid that can facilitate the movement of power around, these markets don't work very well. This is why we have, uh, I live in Texas, we have uh, farm to market roads and uh, in similarly in electricity if you want markets to work well you have to they have to come with uh, infrastructure to move power around now uh, many would argue that given the absence of of uh, electric infrastructure at a national level one of the reasons we have big differences in value of electricity around different parts of the country is because we don't have markets that are interregional and uh, part of the reason for that is we don't have the transmission infrastructure that you need to support some markets. But we are slowly moving uh, in this direction, more reliance on markets and uh, a, a, a recognition, I think, by everybody in the transmission space that uh, one of the really important things that, that wires can do is, is facilitate markets. And then the other point that, that uh, I would reinforce a little bit is, as we have uh, built out the grid over the, we sort of got a pass on the grid for, for some number of years while we moved toward natural gas. And the way basically natural gas works is you build a pipe and the pipe goes underground. We've got well-established authority to, to get lots of pipes built. Uh, and those pipes go to cities. You build a gas-fired power plant relatively close to load. Uh, and off you go. So we had a great infrastructure to move energy in the form of natural gas. Um, as we look for new options uh, on the energy side, uh, renewables are, and this is sort of this weird term of art that we use in the wind industry, we call it a locationally constrained resource, okay? Which is, uh, and we do that with uh, 
anyhow, it seems like a funny term that is only designed for us to understand. But what it basically means is it winds out there in the middle of nowhere and you need wires to get it to market. So uh, as you as we move toward more solar and more wind, uh, we need the wires to get it there. And what we've seen over the last decade or so, there's been, and you saw this in the SPP presentation, big, actually a fair amount of transmission has gotten built over the last decade, a lot of it driven by uh, increasing demand for renewable energy. So when, uh, when Carl talked about SPP hitting 13% and on days 30, 35% of their electricity coming from wind, that's because SPP and its members have gone about the task of building the transmission system to support those new resources. Without the grid, that would not happen. And we see the same thing in Texas, where we just underwent a big transmission build out that, that uh, I'm sure we'll hear more about. Um, and that is facilitating the integration. Uh, interestingly, first of all, of, of new wind, but then as, uh, as new uh, oil resources opened up, there was actually grid required to get to the to drilling rigs and so on, so it supported that. Now with uh, the cost of solar dropping uh, almost by the day, uh, these wires are supporting uh, new, new, uh, new solar projects, which I think reinforces the point that, that the commissioner is making about uh, the role that the grid can provide in terms of optionality. So again, the market facilitation and new, ener new low-cost energy resources are uh, some of the really big trends that we've seen over the last decade and that we think, at least in our business, that are going to be even more powerful uh, over the next 20 years or so. So it, if I could add on to that, I think, I think the grid is not only uh, enabling uh, um, uh, everything else that's going on, I think it also enables the policies that are coming out from uh, either at the federal or state level. So for example, in California, we have a 33% renewable goal. Um, that, that in essence, uh, and PG&E, we're probably 28, 29% there of our, of our sources is renewable, which is very, very important. Um, but what we're finding is, is that uh, it not only enables the market and the ability to transport power back and forth, but we're finding that um, it's, it's also brought a lot of uh, new innovation, I would say, uh, to, to, the, uh, to the markets and abilities to uh, provide different resources. And we talk about storage, we talk about a lot of different things. But we're seeing at it at, at the, not only the transmission level, but we're seeing it at the distribution level. Uh, rooftop solars, um, uh, we have, for example, we have uh, over 150,000 rooftop solar customers at pg and &E. uh, Three years ago, we were connecting about 1,000 a month. Uh, today we're at about 4,000 a month, and we expect that to grow to about 10,000 a month. But what we're seeing, though, at the distribution level is that there's only a certain amount of rooftops uh, that can take solar, right, that take solar panels, and that, that capacity is going to run out. What we're really seeing at the, the policy level, again, to meet that 33 percent, and, and, and many of you know there's a discussion at the, uh, at the California legislator ra legislation to raise that up to 50 percent. Um, but we're seeing, really, to meet that demand, it really requires uh, wind, it requires utility scale type um, renewables to make that happen. And we're seeing a lot of our changes and investments in the, in the transmission system required to meet and to deliver that, whether it's in, it's in the Rocky Mountains in the east or it's uh, down in Southern California for us with uh, where the, most of the solar opportunity is. But it's really uh, utility scale that's, uh, that's, that's really going to make that happen and meet those policies. But again, it's an enabler. So the way we look at it at PG&E is the grid is really, and we've, we've heard it a lot today, is really changing from just to you know, deliver, uh, deliver power from one end to the other integration. Uh, we are really looking at it as a, a network uh, that, that enables um, all kinds of technology, all kinds of uh, interconnections. There's, there's all kinds of different things that we haven't thought about today 
um, that are going to be introduced and want to be interconnected to the grid uh, to buy or sell power, or whatever it is. Uh, and we're seeing a lot of that. We're getting a lot of requests for different uh, technologies that aren't necessarily uh, making it in the mainstream today. And I think that, as we move forward, to me, that's the, that's the real vision or where our 21st century grid or, or whatever you want to call it is going is, um, it, to me, it's almost analogous, analogous to the, uh, the internet to a certain extent. It's, it's really a grid that people want to connect to and do different things, um, whether it's buy or sell power or connect in their, their electric vehicle into one area and charge it and then drive to work and, and sell their energy from the electric vehicle at a different location. It's just giving that, enabling that uh, customer's choice, customer's ability to do whatever they want with that system is where we see it going. Uh, and we uh, at PG&E, we've actually coined it as, you know, you've heard of the Internet of Things, we've coined it as the grid of things. It's kind of, a, you know, whatever you want to call it, but um, it's, that's, what, that's what we really see the 21st century uh, a transmission system as well as a distribution system. Because for us, it's all interconnected. It's wires. And uh, that's, that's what we see the, the, the vision of the future from that. All right, so there's always a risk of going last. <laughs> uh, I would like to start by saying I worked one summer for a few weeks in Albuquerque, so I have my New Mexico <laughs> connection for those of you that have been here all day. I want to go back, though, to the stuff that's not changing. You were asking what's changing. Oh. I think one of the things that, that's really important for us to keep in mind is, and, and I think we heard it earlier today, um, the grid really is the underpinning of our American way of life. We have to continue to invest in the grid. We, ha we have to have a robust grid, a resilient grid, one that can adapt and that is flexible because if you look at, at all that it supports for us today, it, it supports our commerce. It keeps our food cold. It keeps us well lit at night. It provides comfort to us. It allows our medical devices to function. So it's just critical for us, and that's something that's not changing. And, and having a robust, resilient underlying grid is just imperative for us. So what is changing? Hannes, you said earlier today, we're asking the grid, which was built largely in the 60s and 70s. In some cases, it was built long before that. We're asking it to do things today that it wasn't designed to do, and it really wasn't intended to do. It was originally intended to connect you know, neighboring generation stations to improve reliability. Well, we have to continue to focus on improving reliability and enhancing that, but I think you're right on target. <laughs> the, the challenge today is integrating and connecting everything else. The grid doesn't pick generation. We don't care what the voltage source is, whether it's a battery or wind generation. You're right, we're seeing grid um, utility scale solar connecting to the grid in Texas today on lines that were originally built to connect wind. And I think that's just the importance. The other thing is just integrating the new technologies that we're developing. You think of our industry as being a 100-year-old industry, you know, how innovative are poles and wires. At AAP, we've come up with a new design for overhead transmission lines that will allow us to increase throughput on where we in the past may have had a single 345 kV line We've got a, a new line that's developed now that'll let us use the same right of way, shorter towers and, and move one and a half. Or if we want to make it be a, um, a double circuit line, three times the power that we could move down that same existing right of ways today. So to me, the challenge is embedding the new technologies and allowing folks to connect to, what'd you call it? The, the grid of everything? The or? grid of things. Yeah, grid of things. It's a, new, that's, it's a new mantra. I think that's a good approach. <laughs> well, if you were to, uh, um, to look ahead, say, 10 or 15 or even 20 years, we, we may see, well, it's hard to tell what we're going to say. The, the, the things that are being hung on the grid could be quite different. Uh, some of the uncertainties that are being created by, uh, by law or policy uh, could be resolved, maybe not. Maybe they just create more uncertainties. 
But do you have any, uh, you, this is an immensely unfair question, of course, <laughs> you know, you look at your crystal ball, um, what, what, what do you see, um, uh, 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 what's the role for the grid? Is it, is it going to change in fundamental ways in terms of resolving some of these uncertainties? Can we uh, plan a transmission system without knowing what all the uh, gadgets are that are going to be out there that people are going to want to use? Uh, I, I, I think Hanna suggests that there is a way to get at that issue, but it requires a different kind of planning regimen than we have today, or maybe even a different kind of regulation. I don't know. But uh, uh, it, it, if, uh, if you were to uh, uh, time travel a little bit, what, what do you think, where do you think we need to be in 2000? Pick a date, 30. Well, I, I think uh, the main thing to take away is that the grid is going to continue to be very essential. And I think of it in terms of after Superstorm Sandy, there was a lot of talk of microgrids. And you know, I hope I'm not offending anybody here, but microgrids are great. Uh, but, you know, it's going to take a long, long time for them to be widely dispersed and the ones we have now are for very specialized purposes, like Princeton that wants to keep tissue samples that are 70 years old uh, cold so they don't lose them. You know, they were willing to pay a lot more for that. In the meantime, we're seeing market expansions throughout the country. More and more entities are, are joining organized markets. Uh, and it's been really quite remarkable just in the last couple years. And in my home of the Pacific Northwest, which has generally been hostile to it, the effort is growing. It's not a full-blown RTO, but it's essentially taking advantage of the efficiencies that are allowed through uh, a larger transmission footprint where the most efficient, uh, low-cost power dispersed over a wider fo footprint adds reliability, helps consumers. It allows those location-constrained resources to access the grid because they're the wind is usually blowing where there isn't a lot of people consuming power, somewhat similar to solar. So in 15 years, we're going to have a grid, I believe, that will take advantage of, of uh, additional technology that allows us to see into it uh, more frequently, more, 30 times a second as opposed to once every four seconds, for example. But it, it will be as important as ever, even if we have developing distributed generation and microgrids, because those are still going to need to be interconnected. Greg? Yeah. Um, whatever we do, we need to start now, because, uh, I've, you know, we talked about, yeah, it takes five to ten years to build a transmission. I, I would argue that uh, it takes five years just to get the permits, sometimes ten years to get permits. So um, it, we, whatever we're, we need to do, we need to do it now, because it, it takes a lot of of time to do that. I think, I think it really gets back to, there, I mean, it's a multifaceted question. There's a lot of variables to play here, right? And I think, though, when you get back to uh, uh, the policy and the planning component, is that's where it really starts. And I think it, it would be incumbent upon all of us, uh, no matter who it is that's involved in this industry or has influence in the industry, to think about how do we how do we expand the grid such that it's modernized, it's more resilient, uh, whether it's cybersecurity or physical security tax, I mean, it's all of those kind of things, as well as interconnecting all of the zones that we know that renewables are, whether it's wind or solar, we know, we know where those areas are. And I think we need to think about the regional planning or national planning of that and establish policies that enable that to happen. I think it starts with that. So I, I would, uh, I mean, th thinking about the grid in 2030, um, I, I think it's pretty clear that we're, we will have a less carbon intensive fuel mix. And that means a lot more uh, either zero carbon or low carbon energy. Uh, if you think about it from a national perspective, we 
we are actually extremely well endowed with low uh, low cost uh, uh, energy sources in terms of solar, uh, wind, uh, natural gas. So we this this country is if, even from a sort of a global competition perspective, we're in much better shape than most of the rest of the planet if it comes to reducing uh, carbon footprint. Now we got a ways to go, but we're from just a, a natural resource perspective, we're, we're in a pretty good spot um, if we can figure out how to how to get all this done. I think the other big thing that we'll see is more uh, efficiency will clearly play a role, but uh, the most popular high-end car in the country these days is a Tesla. And so uh, we will place new, every time we come up with more efficient things, we're going to come up with uh, exciting new things to plug into the wall, and that will, uh, and that's noteworthy because it's it's very very difficult to decarbonize the uh, liquid fuel uh, world, and it's very hard to replicate uh, a barrel of oil in terms of its energy intensity. Uh, but with electricity, you can make electricity a lot of different ways through naturally occurring phenomena. Uh, it's really hard to do that uh, to in, if you're going to try to make fuel. So that, if, if we're thinking about sort of a 20, 30 time frame, I, I just have to think that's going to be part of the equation. I think some other things that, that we'll need to see, uh, I, I'm going to call it cooperative planning as opposed to interregional. Interregional seems to, you know, get people's hackles yeah. up. But <laughs> co <laughs> cooperative planning, I think, needs to take place to address some of the issues you were, you were talking about. Um, I think we're going to see uh, better coordination between the gas and electric sectors. Appreciate what's going on there. That, that's very important if we're going to to be able to really address the the needs of the country as as there's a bigger shift toward natural gas as a fuel. Um, in many cases, it it could be a lot easier to move the electricity than to move the gas, and I think we have to look at that and figure out the the right approach uh, on that front. You know, one, one trend that we're seeing uh, so far is really the, uh, what I call the electrification of the transportation industry, you know, electric vehicles. I think that's, uh, that's going to become much more of an influence and much more of an impact on our industry than, uh, than people realize. Well, you, you guys will be seeing it more than anybody. What are you, what are you seeing? Uh, we're seeing a lot of it. We're seeing, um, uh, we're seeing certain pockets of demand picking up, but it's a, again, it's a multifaceted grid and planning. You've got renewables, you've got a lot of different things that are going on from a planning perspective. Uh, but we are seeing a big increase in, uh, in electric vehicles. And, and it's not only the increase from the load perspective, but it, it's also going back to what I mentioned earlier is customers want uh, the flexibility to do whatever they want with the grid, just like you can do with your iPhone today, right? You want all kinds of different things, right? And we're seeing customers that want to, again, they want to charge up in all kinds of different locations. They want to discharge and sell their power back to us in all kinds of different locations, not just one interconnection point. So we're seeing a lot of that kind of demand where it's, it's uh, again, not just a single point, but multi-point type activity. And so there's a lot. Of, I think that's going to be a big impact for us as an industry. I think the other thing that's going to be interesting to see exactly where it goes is, uh, you know, FERC Order 1000 is really just kind of getting off the ground. And, and as we see what happens there, it's going to be important to have a level playing field for everybody that's playing and make sure that, you know, we're all following the, the same approach generally so that mm -hmm. it is a level playing field across the country. Yeah. Well, let me put one more issue on the table, and then I'm going to open it up for all of you. I know you're itching to ask this panel some questions, but... Uh, one, one issue that comes to mind when we're talking about change uh, uh, is new business models. Um, at least three of you are involved in uh, an industry, uh, I think one of you described it as, you know, building transmission to connect, you know, the, the, the local generation with load, and, and that was about it. Now we're looking at uh, a, a transmission AOA is, is more of an enterprise. There are new entities out there. Uh, perhaps uh, Clean Line is represented, one representative example of a non utility 
transmission company. Uh, those, those business models are changing. They're changing with joint ventures and uh, spin-offs and, and uh, new companies that we hadn't even thought of uh, 15 years ago. Uh, any, any observations about where all that might be headed from a, from a business perspective? I, all you guys with MBAs, I mean, you'll be able to have, figure this out. I'll, I'll start. Um, you know, it's interesting because we're seeing a lot of different players in the industry, not so much owning the wires and the grid. I mean, there's a, there, there are. There's utility players, and they're coming. They're, they're, a lot of the same players are taking different forms. Um, but what we are seeing is a lot of other people getting in, into the business. For example, I don't know if you know this, but just the other day, Google announced uh, that they're going to build a utility-grade solar facility in partnership with, I think it's First for Solar and things like that. But they're doing, why are they doing it? I mean, why would Google be wanting to get into the generation business? Well, they see a benefit from an environmental perspective. They see a benefit from an energy <laughs> perspective. But they're doing it to meet their own needs. So I think we're going to see a lot more larger, more sophisticated customers starting to do their own kind of thing. Um, and then that, to me, is another player in, in our industry and, and another customer that we have to uh, we have to meet their their needs well and another one like that you know Tesla is working on batteries not yeah. just for cars but for you know utility applications that that's another place that you're seeing um, I think the other piece that, that you're going to keep seeing it's going to be technology companies like Google but it's trying to get at the meter so that they can work to offer products to you know customers uh, at a meter you know, one of the things we've seen in Texas, is, uh, most of the utilities there have deployed smart meters uh, that are there so that, you know, they get 15-minute read increments. We don't actually sell to end-use customers. There are retail electric providers in Texas that do that. But they're starting to offer all kinds of different products. To You can buy prepaid electricity uh, from many of the retail providers if you want. Um, you can have free nights and weekends uh, if you want. It's just the different products that they're... Uh, starting to offer to customers to meet their requirements as well as to address the demand issues that the suppliers have. So, uh, not to be too contrarian, I don't think over the next few years we're going to see a ton of business model innovation on the wire side of things. Uh, traditionally, uh, the 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 new upstarts like us in, on the wire side of things are typically focusing on HVDC projects or SEAMS projects that go between, you know, New York ISO or um, and PJM or uh, Manhattan to New Jersey, uh, et cetera. But they're not. Um, we, we haven't seen a lot, and I don't think we're going to see a lot of new companies springing up that are in sort of the competitive transmission realm uh, other than existing utilities who sort of recast themselves and and largely in defensive mode because they're worried about some other utility coming in and trying to fish in their pond so they arm themselves up to to go fish in somebody else's pond uh, it's a um, and it's it and I, I think FERC went as far as they sort of felt they could in terms of creating uh, trans uh, competition in the transmission space, but um, you know you really need to go to Brazil or certain provinces in Canada if you want to find full-on competitive transmission where uh, instead of saying hey you invest some money. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll largely put up with your cost overruns, and we will guarantee you a certain rate of return. That's kind of the world we're in today. Other folks who've tried to solve for the same riddle have said, okay, we've got point A to B here. Uh, you tell us how much you need in terms of revenue requirements each year. And whoever's revenue requirements are the lowest gets to build the project. And so that particular developer, and, and I'm referring here to Brazil in particular, gets 
has to optimize their design. They have to build an efficient project. They have to optimize their capital structure around that. And lo and behold, the people who pay for all this, the ratepayers, generally get a dramatically better deal out of a competitive process like that. And I know that there's folks at FERC who would like to go there, but the, the, we don't have the framework in place at, at the state level and the federal level to make that happen. But if we think about what a, uh, a truly competitive world might look like 15 years down the road, I think you probably have to focus a little bit on, less on the here and now and tweaking the model here and now in the U.S., but and look at, at what the uh, how effective competition is in bringing down costs uh, uh, elsewhere elsewhere around the world. So, uh, but absent this sort of fairly dramatic departure from our current regulatory paradigm, it's hard to see like huge changes in the business model landscape on the wire side. There are opportunities, and we're firm believers in that, but it's not a wide open competitive world here in the U.S. You agree on that? Oh, I agree. Uh, to FERC's credit, and I think this started really when you were there, Jim, uh, the Commission's been open, and certainly I have been to a variety of business models. And there is quite a variety out there in terms of some of the projects. Order 1000 trying to inject more competition, but there are the merchant pro, uh, uh, proposals that we have certain guidelines on in terms of uh, how we approach them. There are a lot of joint ventures. Uh, I think of uh, the Sunrise Project in, Sandy, in the San Diego area, which was both a utility and a mm -hmm. and you know citizens' energy uh, building a power line. Uh, we've, we've seen, again, uh, more interest in the concept of, of an outside developer joining perhaps an incumbent utility. Uh, there's a, obviously there's ways to go, particularly on the interregional, uh, which we really didn't tackle in Order 1000 and has a lot of potential, but uh, there's such Order 1000 fatigue right now that we kind of have to get through this before we, I think, take on any, any big major issues. But... Uh, there, there were issues I had with Order 1000 that I didn't think we made the right call. Overall, I, I thought it had benefits, and at least one example of that is when PJM put out uh, their bid for the Artificial Island, which was an area where there are nuclear plants, a long-time issue that had to be resolved, and they got 27 bids in that ranged from, I think, $157 million to $2.1 billion. And then there were three finalists, and we haven't resolved it, and there will probably be litigation to go. But the point is you inject some competition. You get the, the, the creative new approaches that ultimately, uh, assuming, you know, ultimately benefit ratepayers and hopefully the reliability of the system as well. That's, that's, very, that's a very great answer, Red. Questions for this panel? Yes, Kurt. Hi, Kurt Perlin with Stantec. Um, I have a question that I guess follows on some of the dialogue and conversation that we've had today. Uh, how do you anticipate um, the transmission grid being able to respond to consumers' non-logical decisions? In other words, um, it's hard to make a cost-effective argument for an Audi, uh, but yet people buy Audis all the time. And I think we're seeing that now where uh, consumers are making decisions to, uh, to to buy new technologies and implement new technologies that don't make good cost-effective sense. And we need to anticipate where those decisions are going to go in the future. So how do we do that? And in particular, how do we do that when we are looking at uh, the logic model for new transmission in terms of a cost-benefit analysis? Thank you. I guess that's a tough question. Nobody wanted to. It, it is, um, yeah. I, I think it, uh, it when you when it really bottom line. If you get to the bottom line, it's all around the price signals to that consumer or whoever and and that customer that wants to interconnect to the grid, and it really gets back to the markets. If there's a if there's a robust market and there's a price signal or an opportunity um, to reduce that price, I think that's really what the the trigger is. And I don't we don't 
we don't have that yet, I don't believe, uh, in our industry, especially even at the distribution level. I, you, you know, customers aren't seeing uh, that level, um, and I think it's really, it really boils down to that. If we can get to that point where if you want to buy an Audi and you can afford it, you can buy one. I mean, that's what we've got to get to. Yeah, so I would question the, the uh, premise of the question. I mean, people buy Audis because they like them, and it's a, I don't have one, but it's a, you know, I've ridden in them, they're nice cars, and they perform well, and there's a certain prestige associated with them, and those are, I don't know, maybe in some people's view that's not a rational thing, but um, it's, I think we need to accommodate consumer preferences, rational or not, and I think that's what you're getting at. So if somebody says, I want solar panels on my roof because that's cool, then what we ought to do is say, you can do that, uh, and you're going to get roughly the wholesale value of that electricity. We're not going to subsidize it because you're typically, you know, you're probably driving an Audi or a Tesla as well with your solar panels. Um, so you're in a certain income bracket, and we shouldn't subsidize that. Um, but if you want to show off to your friends that you've got cool solar panels on your roof, then, you know, we should make that option available to you. If I could add to that, if I may. Um, I think it's all around, I, I think where we're going with the grid and the grid of things and that kind of uh, uh, enablement, um, uh, we, the, the rate structures associated with really have to match that. And they don't today. I mean, you look at the internet, right? I don't know what you pay, but between internet and uh, cable TV, I, I think I'm paying about 200 bucks a month, a fixed rate. And I use it a lot. I got unlimited access to it. So uh, wh whereas the electric system, it's, you know, you pay on usage. So I think we've got to somehow make sure that the rate structure matches, uh, the, you know, where we're going with the, with the grid. Just explain that. Explain that? The rate structure, yeah. Uh, it's, no, it's I can't. very important. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> no. It's a non-subtle point. Yeah, we don't have enough time, I don't <laughs> think, for that. Well, well, that's what I wanted to build on. I'll, I'll, I'll twist the question a little bit in that uh, it was alluded to by Michael, but we have this, like it or not, this complex tension between state and federal regulation. Our state colleagues regulate the distribution side. Uh, we're at the wholesale level. Uh, one trend to watch for is those are somewhat converging with distributed generation, and there's probably a battle on the horizon related to uh, jurisdiction over some of those power sales. But setting that aside, uh, it's easy for me uh, to talk about the retail rate making because I don't have to face the consequences, but that doesn't stop me. Um, and, and the fact is that consumers are not seeing accurate price signals now at the retail level. And and I hope they do, because I think it will be transformational, will be, uh, you know, every other aspect of our lives, we see some kind of dynamic or real-time pricing. Whether you're going to a sporting event or an airline ticket, gasoline that you're buying, uh, you know, we're in a new world that's different than 10 years ago. On electricity, you're paying, you know, flat rates, maybe seasonal rates. But the reality is that, that the value of that product is, is, is enormously expensive for 200 hours a year, but you're, you're paying the same rate you'd play in the middle of the night. And uh, if consumers got accurate real-time price signals, and it's, it's really not about uh, the poor getting hurt because they're already paying it. Arguably, they are subsidizing rich people right now uh, when, when energy is the most valuable. So I think we've got great potential. That will empower consumers to make decisions that are more rational based on the value of the product, and, and I think we'll have a much more efficient system. However, it's going to be controversial. And, and again, that's why it's easy for me to expound on it, because I don't have to face the heat. <laughs> great question. Yes, sir. Let's wait for the mic, Aaron. I'm Brent Nelson. I'm a AAAS policy fellow at DOE. Um, my question is kind of related to your last comment, which is I was wondering if you could comment on impacts and opportunities for peak shifting and the impacts that would have on transmission, either through demand response or load scheduling or storage or uh, other means. 
so some of the product i was mentioning in texas or that's exactly what they're doing the customers don't know that exactly what they're doing you know but when you're offering free nights and weekends they're really trying to shift their peak you know off to, to get folks out of the on peak times and getting to real time pricing is really a challenge some places you know, folks are really against even having a smart meter which is just an advanced technology installed at their home um, but I think ultimately it's kind of where you, where you have to go so I can give you a real-time example. We, uh, right now, uh, we have a lot of solar that's come into our service territory, especially on the southern end. And obviously the best time for solar is in the afternoon. We get a lot of it. And the load tends to come up. Our peak is just right around sunset or in the latter part of the day, especially in the wintertime. Well, uh, what, we find, what we're finding is that there's almost too much solar during that time period to where we, we need load. We're looking for load to offset the solar so we don't have to, I know the ISO is looking so we don't have to, to curtail solar. I mean, you don't want to get into that situation, right? Um, so we are, we have a, our Helms pump storage, about a 1200 megawatt facility down in that area. Um, we now pump during the day, uh, which is just kind of those that have been around the industry, I mean, it was always to, run at night and uh, you know to offset the demands of the central power stations etc so it, the the whole load and the forecast and the and the demands and things of that are, are certainly changing big time and, and we're seeing it today and uh, the solar is obviously being very disruptive in this sense and uh, Hawaii is really grappling with it right now it's the over generation issue that's kind of flipped the traditional uh, peak shifting on its head Still, most of the country is going to have most of the population until we'll have the traditional peak shifting problem, uh, Midwest, East Coast, unless there's just massive solar penetration. But um, but it's an exciting time, and I think people paying attention to what the Hawaii Commission is doing uh, will be very informative, and then California is not far behind. All right, so I'm going to kind of rat out my wife, so I'm glad she's not here. I've been in this industry for 26 years. She comes in one night. We, you know, I'd mentioned that it's going to be a high peak, so there's, you know, it's going to be kind of tight that afternoon. So she says, "So should I not run the dishwasher and do the clothes?" Okay. So my wife, who I talk about this stuff frequently at home, you know, there's no price signal at home, but it's like, well, yeah, you should. She goes, "So will it be cheaper?" It's like, well, no, but it's the right thing to do. Right, so let's conserve right now, and then we can we can do the dishes later this evening. Again, it's the disconnect um, that's there, and somehow we've got to be able to communicate that to really drive home those programs and methodologies you're talking about. Michael, no. Um, uh, no, my only comment is okay. is uh, if huh? I'm going to ask Wade to talk to my wife as well because <laughs> <laughs> my wife thinks I have the most boring job on earth, and she won't even let me talk about this stuff at all. <laughs> Dan, we've got time for one more question, and then we'll. Uh, have thank to you, and it's much a uh, comment as a question, but there's, you're saying there's a disconnect at the residential level. I want to say there's also, I think, a disconnect at the market level. So if you're trying to run a pump storage plant, you put individual bids and offers into the market. They can take one, but not the other. So you're committed to, to uh, you're committed to pump, but you may not have the, uh, they may not take your energy, or they'll take your energy, but uh, but you won't get the energy to be able to pump because those are broken apart. Plus, also, the system is set up to give you an incremental uh, tax, essentially, on a losses, uh, and which is a surcharge in order, because of that. But when you're really doing fuel storage and fuel delivery, you're paying a tax to, 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 to uh, provide future value. You're providing a tax to, to return that. And that money doesn't go to the generator. It reduces it reduces the economic performance of the person who wants to do pump storage. So there's, uh, there's not only disconnects. Once you get into storage, there's a whole set of disconnects that also apply at the market level. And I guess if it wanted to be a question, what are we going to do about that?
So uh, let me comment. I, I think um, it's not only storage, but it's also a market. So uh, in California, the ISO started the energy imbalance market to help deal with those, uh, those issues, this overgeneration issue. And it's actually working. Uh, and it's working very well by just basically bringing in a broader uh, portfolio of generators. We're going into Pacific Corps area. They've joined Nevada, others that can help balance uh, that out. So markets is also an, op an option. Well, before I adjourn this, uh, this panel, I want to thank them for uh, stimulating discussion. Altogether too short, I'm afraid. But um, while, while uh, we're filing out, I want to make sure that everybody thinks about giving us, giving WIRE some feedback on today's session. Uh, you can find us uh, at hushblackwell.com or find me there anyway. Uh, you can tweet us at, at WIRE's group uh, or you can contact us through our website, uh, wiresgroup.com. Uh, it's been a splendid day. We've had a great deal of fun. We had some great, great panelists, and uh, you guys were just terrific. You capped it off. So thank you very much.